Holy cow, Rec Poker Nation, it's really happening. It is the championship match of Marek Madness. Thanks to everyone who's joining us here live tonight on Twitch. My name's Jim Reed. I'm going to be your co-host tonight because I am pleased to be joined by All-American Poker Pro WSOP bracelet winner, Midwest boy done good, the one and only Ryan LaPlante. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Thanks for having me here. I I'm looking forward to a tough battle between two rec poker greats. We got Taylor Maz and Chris. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his last name. Chris Jones. We call there him Jonesy. Go. And and there, you're in for a treat tonight because this is the battle of the titans. I've said before, if someone put a gun to my head and said, who are the best two poker players on the rec poker team? I would have to say it's Taylor and Chris. I'd want to add a couple more people in there, but these two are the cream that has risen to the top. We've done this uh, bracket tournament. We had eight core team members going head to head, uh, duking it out in various matches. Um, uh, Taylor started having to defeat website Mark. And then he took out Andrew uh, Feist to get here. Chris had to start uh, versus Chad McVean, the immortal Twitter warrior, but he found a weak spot and moved on and then took out Rob uh, on his way to the championship here. And we also had uh, Steve Fredland, of course, and uh, John Somsky uh, playing. And this is what has happened. We have Chris Jones, who's the uh, content director at rec.poker. So he does all our seminars. He guides a lot of our learning material here. And uh, Taylor, who's just such a naturally gifted poker player, um, you will remember he was a finalist in the LPP yes, staking he deal. He got, uh, he got pretty screwed on that final table in a couple of spots, <laughs> but he played really well down the stretch. Yeah, that was a lot of fun to watch. And we even did a little rec poker prep session to uh, drill down on some of his opponents. And I think he got the wrong side of the deck in a couple spots there. We'll see what happens tonight. Um, Taylor has been running pretty good in his uh, in his matches so far. Uh, and we'll see if there is some comeuppance here. So uh, basically, Taylor and Chris are no strangers to each other. Um, they've known each other for a while. They're both good Minnesota boys. Well, I don't know if they're good boys. They're from Minnesota. That's fair. I know them well enough to say that. And uh, they don't mind taking it out on each other either. Um, these two are always going at it on Twitter, giving each other the gears in our uh, learning sessions and in our discussions and that kind of thing. Um, so I expect it's going to be a good, uh, a good fight tonight. I think we're in for, we're in for a treat. Um, so we've had a few predictions coming through. We put up uh, the offer for folks and fans to fill out a bracket and see how well they did. And you were kind enough, Ryan, to offer uh, four yes. winners uh, a free month at Learn Pro Poker, which is going to be great. Um, so we'll see uh, a little later how the brackets are turning out. In the meantime, um, Learn Pro Poker and Rec Poker are doing a bunch of great stuff together. Yes, um, definitely. I am so excited about this. I know we don't want to take all night talking about it, but I could. <laughs> uh, we're doing these study groups. There's even one this Saturday where we're going to be taking premium Learn Pro Poker training videos and breaking them down with Rec Poker members and Learn Pro Poker members. We've yep. got this Sunday night um, uh, home game that you're playing in sometimes we put a bounty yep. on you <laughs> so everyone's gunning for ryan in the lpp sunday night tournament um so there's just a, a bunch of fun ways that we're getting together and expanding the community it's it's great it's great to have you more on board yeah it's nice to have another group working with us i mean the upside of lpp of course is you know we have all this training content and stuff but I'm not really a community person, so to speak. You know, I obviously I, you know, love helping build community and that type of stuff, but I don't really have a background in that. So joining with you guys, I mean, you just have such a, a natural approach to things. And, you know, that's something that I care a lot about. And I really want to see that type of thing grow. I think it's really important just in general in poker to have a welcoming, open community. And, and also like people of, of like mindsets and abilities, learning and growing together. I think mm. that's the best way to improve. So from a learning standpoint and just from a game standpoint, it's just great to, to work with guys like you and, and gals, of course. And I'm really looking forward to all the stuff we're going to be doing. I mean, the study groups and that type of stuff is just beginning of it for sure. 
Yeah, exactly. I love that. And it just feels like such a great fit. Um, I can't wait to see what the rest of the year holds and uh, how many how many exciting things we can do. And I think the real key that you're saying there is that learning together in community with like minded people. Um, I think that's especially in the poker world. It's it's not all that common that uh, you can find folks that want to be respectful and fun and have a good time, but still compete and you know take it very seriously. So yes. it's uh, it's it's a fun group. I'm I'm real lucky to be here, and uh, I'm excited to see what what's coming up. So. Uh, here we are. Well, why don't we take a look at the bracket um, challenge? We'll see sort of the standings at this point um, right now. So there's still there's still room here. Uh, there's some interesting little stats we want to get into here. Chris and Taylor were no dark horses here. In fact, 29% uh, of all the brackets completed had uh, Chris and Taylor in the final. So almost a third of all the picks had these two in there. 33% um, of all brackets had Chris winning. And 17% of all brackets had Taylor winning. So that's, uh, rem that's almost half the, half the picks to win were one of these two. Um, we, put, we put out a Twitter poll today, and uh, I think it just closed. And the poll came in at 57% uh, favoring Chris to win tonight. So it's going to be neck and neck. It's going to be a good fight. Um, personally, this is a... This is a they're both so good at this, but they kind of, they do have different styles. They're both very aggressive players. Um, Chris is extremely thoughtful and strategic. He's probably the most cerebral poker player uh, that I know. Um, so he's going to be, he's going to have planned a lot of this out. He's going to have been thinking about how to dig into Taylor and exploit him. Um, and Taylor is just so good at adapting and reacting to the people that he's playing against. Um, I've been kind of weighing it back and forth from a prediction. And if you're, if folks in the chat, let's do prediction time right now. It's, uh, we're, the, we're, this is a best two out of three match. So we don't know exactly how long it's gonna go, but just for fun, um, if you're here in the chat, why don't you type in who you think is gonna be the Marek Madness champion, the inaugural champion. Now, now that I say it out loud, Taylor has this thing about becoming the inaugural champion for things. He was the inaugural rec poker player of the year. Um, trust me, we keep hearing about it. And uh, uh, I'm, mm, okay, now I'm not so sure. I'm still picking Chris because I'm sticking with my pick, but now I'm, uh, now I'm not so sure. We are getting some, some chat uh, guesses here. Colin Anderson, who is a host of our Recce's Award Show, Picks Taylor, Mr. D's, that's Rich from Tuesday Nights. He says, Chris, window guy, 1954, who recently made it to a final table of our Tournament of Champions, takes Taylor. Uh, HRL Westy says, Chris Jones. Uh, let me see, we've got Taylor, uh, Steve, who cares what he says. Um, Pet Vet Kim says, Taylor in three. Chapo Australia says, Chris, Poker Geek MN, that's the one and only John Somsky. <laughs> can always be relied on to put himself out there. He says he thinks Taylor or Chris will win. Way to go. Way to go, John. Real, and real tough. I actually picked Taylor from the beginning. So oh, yeah. All my money's on him. <laughs> okay, so you and I are going head to head here, oh, too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I love it. Okay, well, uh, let me see. I'll get a few more chats in here, and then I think we'll just get started. Um, we says he knows a Chris. <laughs> uh, Keto man's picking Jonesy. So we got a pretty good mix here. I think the fan, the group says, uh, the group seems to be on the Chris side. If we had to pick yes. a, a anecdotally here. And yes, I think it's going to be a good job. And I'm with Steve Fredlin. I want to see pocket fives feature prominently tonight somehow. Just somehow. That would be great. Chris had the opportunity of a lifetime to actually take someone out. He won his first match with pocket fives. You just oh, don't get situations crazy. like that, right? Like, come on. How, how does he draw that to, up? To win a match on your favorite hand is a pretty nice thing to do. So maybe he had the Cinderella story from the start. Oh, yep. That's right. Layers. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, we've heard a lot from the chat. We've gotten excited. Let's roll right into the first match. So what we're going to do is the, we're going to see the whole cards here. Um, and it's going to go by pretty quickly. So we'll try and... Uh, uh, tailor our commentary to what's happening um, on the screen at the time, but it's, it's, we're just going to sort of soak it all in and see how it goes here. Yep. 
Uh, pretty typical race here with the Jack 7 offsuit. I mean, they're super deep effective, so it doesn't really matter too much what you're doing here. As long as you're raising the button most of the time, it's going to be a pretty good thing. Um, yes. It's generally super deep stack. You don't really want to be limping the button at all. Yeah, starting with 5,000 chips, they do have a lot of play. And um, even when the blinds do start to come up, experienced players like this aren't going to be making a bunch of, you know, spewy errors mm -hmm. pre-flop. So I think I think the stacks will be uh, will be helpful here. All right, the Shaq 10 pre-flop is actually a really good candidate to 3-bet, even at the stack depth. Um, works pretty well either as a check call or check raise, flopping the gutter and having the jack high. Um, on these monotone boards, don't really want to check raise too often on. Hmm. Uh, which one is Chris? Uh, Chris is that at the bottom of your there. screen there, five by five. And uh, he Taylor's has, yeah, Taylor's up top. Yeah. Uh, so this turn card's pretty interesting. Taylor turning the gutter ball and having this king high. It's a decent amount of equity, pretty good to barrel with. I would like the barrel a lot more if we had a diamond. So mm. not having a diamond in our hand, this king four is a really good bet, bet, check, give up. But if we had a diamond in our hand, then I would turn it into a triple barrel. So it's amazing. Just, no, just no. the difference that that makes is really impressive. Yeah. So the thing is, is that, I mean, just because we don't have showdown here doesn't mean we need to follow through on it. Because if you're following through on every hand that doesn't have showdown, you're going to have a lot of hands in there that you're triple barreling off. Like, mm. let's say you had a hand like eight, nine with the diamond. You know, you're going to want to triple barrel that. And if you're barreling every single brick straight draw and flush draw, that's just so many hands you're barreling, you're going to be way over barreling. And then Chris can just bluff catch, bluff catch, bluff catch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess it makes sense that Chris is five 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 with his favorite <laughs> hand being five five. Uh, oh my god, level. summoned. <laughs> summoned. He must have <laughs> I wonder what's going through his head right now. <laughs> he's I'm thinking. surprised he's just calling it. You know, if it's your favorite hand in your deep stack, why not three bet it? <laughs> That's right. I really push it. Push Come some on, good Chris. equity. <laughs> Doesn't really have much of a reason to bet this turn card, so we should check and use it as a bluff catcher. Jack eight turning this extra equity is going to be a really good card to bet. Mm. Um, I probably would have just bet flop though. Um, this hand can turn pretty good equity. Yeah, if we get check raise, we're mostly folding, but it's perfectly fine if we're getting check raise off of this for the most part. Um, Chris should definitely be calling. The only thing with these fives is when your opponent checks back and then bets turn and then follows through on betting river, kind of looks like they have a queen or a nine and not mm. that many bluffs. Mm. Um, I would assume Taylor's going to be pretty willing to fire this bet, which it looks like he is. Uh, it's just three quarters pot, which is a, a nice value-ish type bet. So definitely one that I would be kind of worried about even with, the, uh, with these pocket fives. Uh, Chris folding these fives would be kind of surprising just because, you know, it's his favorite hand. And, you know, how, how are you going to fold your favorite hand? You're going to bluff catch something. You got to bluff catch this. Hey, there you go. Hey. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, if Taylor knew he had pocket fives there, he probably hey, wouldn't have tried. Never, never, ever, ever. He would have just folded on flop, not even... <laughs> Just lost of min chips possible. That's right. We were telling Taylor what he should do if he gets pocket fives is fold it pre-flop and just show yeah. Chris and get in his head, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, here's one of those spots where it's just who's going to bet at it first, right? Well, in position being the pre-flop opener, um, they should just continue their aggression. You actually don't really need to go very big on these on this board texture. Uh, this board texture is very dry. Um, it's somewhat dynamic in that the best time possible can change on a lot of cards, but it's not really dynamic for the situation. So a tiny C bet should take it down a lot. Mm. Uh, the queen four actually shouldn't really be a fold there. Um, should actually be a call because you can turn straight draws on kings, tens, threes, and fives, and the queen high by itself might be good. Mm. So hands like king and queen high go way up in value when your head's up because you only have the you only have the one opponent, but on top of that, they also just have a very loose range. Mm. You know, even if they're playing somewhat tight on the button, um, if they're just raising most buttons, they're still going to have like 85, 90% of hands. So because of that, your, you know, queen high turns into a pretty good hand. Yeah. And I think for us recreational players, we're not used to thinking about queen high as a showdown hand. Mm -hmm. um, but when you play enough heads up, you do realize like that shorthanded play that getting right. that to showdown is really valuable. Yeah. It's really, really, really powerful. Um, something I would note is pre-flop, this three bet needs to be a little bit larger because we're very deep effective plus out of position. I do like this C-bet size a lot, though. Um, Chris actually has a pretty easy decision to call or raise. 
Um, this hand works very well both ways. Um, I actually really like it as a raise because there are a lot of turn cards that we actually really dislike mm. when we're facing an aggression, but that we can instead apply aggression back on our opponent and we get some immediate equity denial and then can also run barrels down on a lot of different cards in the deck. Yep. Facing this aggression, though, we're going to be get put into a lot of really tough spots like this turn king. Um, like we could legitimately have the best hand here pretty easily, yet we still can't really do anything outside of folding it, unfortunately. On the flop, it's really good to have the ace of clubs in our hand because we can use it to push aggression. On the turn, when they're betting into us, we now block a hand that they could have mm. as a bluff, like ace high flush draw. So then we can just fold it more easily. Yeah, that's a concept that I think a lot of people have trouble wrapping their head around, but how that having that ace blocker can be like a good thing and a bad thing at various yeah. points of the hand. Someone should write a whole book just about that. <laughs> <laughs> to block or not block, that is the question. <laughs> right. Hey, there you go. All right, we got a chapter heading already. I'm yeah, writing that there down. There you go. <laughs> Put that in the new uh, Rec Poker publication. <laughs> so seven eight of hearts shallow or effective i would mm. generally just be calling this but at this stacked up it works great as a three bet so i would actually use this as a three bet bluff um the main reason why we want to use a hand like this as a good three bet bluff is because it gives us some really good board coverage so now when we three bet we don't just have you know these high broadway hands we also have some of these really good middling playability hands uh, again i would have three bet larger uh looks like taylor's only like 3.3x three betting which if i'm going that small it's it would be because I would expect my opponent to overfold. I wouldn't really expect Chris to be overfolding. So I would ramp up the size pre-flop to really encourage more folds mm. because like, you know, the thing is, is if you're going too small, it's going to be a lot harder for your bluffs to get folds, which is really, really important. And then your value hands are also not building the pots that they want to build. And then on top of that, we're out of position. And if you're three betting your weak hands, you're now bloating a pot out of position and you're not getting the folds that you want. So it's, you know, mm. a lot of bad things can happen. This yeah. Is why, like pre-flop sizing is really, really important. I completely agree. And, and these, both these players, um, they're not afraid of, uh, of having a wide three betting range here. So mm -hmm. I think that's something that they really got to have the, the sizing nailed down for that because otherwise right. you're just encouraging people to play, um against you when you have a, a wide weak range and you'd rather at least put them to a tougher decision i like that yeah exactly yeah you definitely want folds like getting a full mm. preflop's great yeah um you know even if you have a hand that's somewhat strong that's kind of going for value you had like ace nine you know just taking it down and winning that you know here when they open there's two and a half from the open plus the one and then another like quarter that's in there so there's essentially three and a half big blinds in the middle so when you three bend, they fold, you win at 350 BB per 100, which is a very mm. good win rate. Win <laughs> yeah. rate. That's right. It's not the worst thing. Uh, we got a question in the chat about um, how wide should a three bet uh, range be so, as a percentage? I know it's situational. But. Yeah. And, and heads up, it's very stacked up uh, relevant. Um, I want to say heads up this deep. Um, it's probably with the ante, it should probably be around 20 ish percent, um, maybe a little bit lower but should be right around there. Um, and then the shallower effective you get, it'll generally stay around that 15 to 20-ish percent range. But uh, as you get shallower and shallower and shallower, it just adds more and more shoves um, and shifts the types of hands we use. Because you know when we're at like 25 big blinds, you don't really want a three bet fold a hand like king four suited. Mm. But when you're at 100 big blinds, king four suited becomes a really good three bet candidate because your opponent isn't going to four bet shove on you a lot. They're just going to call a lot. So actually what a three bet a hand like this, this deep effective. Mm. And, and when you do get shallower, um, what are some good hands to include in that kind of polarized three betting range? If it's yeah, not going to be some of these like, other ones. Yeah. You want to use one of those high card blocker hands, but ones that don't have that great playability. So like a, a queen seven off a king six off stuff like that. Cool. And I think that's hard for, for our recreational players to also think about that, yeah. right? As because that's just not a very natural mm -hmm. selection in a three bet. But part of the part of what's good about it is that it's an easy decision if they re-raise. Right. And it's a hand that you would be making zero from by folding otherwise. So if you right. can even get anything uh, for it, that's that's well, uh, heads up in you those need to. Bots tend to be fairly profitable too. So like you you never want to really use a three bet with a hand that you would only fold as a reply. It's very, very rare that a hand is 
a three bet or a fold. Most of the time hands are either three bets or calls mm. because if the hand isn't even good enough to call with, why are you thinking about three betting? it? It's just, it doesn't, you know, it's very incongruent. Um, and equi- and like a lot of how you three bet spaced around the equity the hand has, the playability it has. So it's just overall utility. And if the hand isn't good enough to call with, then it truly doesn't have enough utility to three bet with. So, so we should- four is suited is a really good candidate to use as a three mm. bet this deep. Um, if we were shallower, let's say we were like 30 big blinds deep effective, I'd probably actually just jam it pre-flop. Mm. For like 50 or 60, you can go anywhere between three bet or peeling. And then super deep effective, I'm just going to three bet it. Yeah, that's one of my sort of canonical three bet hands, that ace four suited, ace five suited. Um, and so I think when when people think about their uh, balancing their three betting range, it sounds like mm-hmm. you're saying that they should really be focusing more on the bottom of their calling range and not the top of their folding range. Those so are the kind of hands. You generally want to have actually a little bit of everything. You want to have some of like some of the bottom of your calling range, but mostly a lot of hands that we use as three bets tend to be more the middling part of our of our calling range because the ones at the bottom they're so weak in you know usefulness that you just want to call them only or even consider folding them Mm. so generally the hands that you're three betting are hands that are really good calls but the reason what makes them really good calls also makes them really good three bets so that's why there's that's why if you look at like a range trainer pro there will be tons of hands that are just like 50% 50% call, 50% three bet. And it's because the hand just has great playability. Yeah, I've seen that. And it's, you know, as you get deeper, um, almost all the hands end up being a mix between uh, calling and three betting, which is, uh, again, sort of an adjustment that I think some right. recreational players need to take. Yeah, it's because the deeper effective you are, you need to just have stronger ranges in every spot. So pretty typical open and C bet by Taylor there. Um, he actually C bet around 40% pot, which is good. You know, a a higher board texture that's generally good for him. Um, something that makes heads up kind of difficult um, and that most players really have a lot of difficulty with heads up three handed, four handed is that both players have very wide ranges. Mm. But the thing is, is that you can still narrow them down somewhat. Like when Taylor defends a big blind, he obviously doesn't have like the top 10% of hands. And he also doesn't have like the bottom 5%. And he also doesn't have at higher frequencies some of the other top 20 percent of hands so there's a lot of hands that just aren't in his range and then you can just steadily start breaking it down and down and down mm. so like on the flop you know when, when taylor check calls he probably doesn't have 10 9 um and he doesn't right. have ace 10 because he didn't three bet pre-flop um on this turn card when chris bets very large well now taylor if he does call taylor could also have some queen x but mm-hmm. let's say Chris instead had bet a third pot and then Taylor calls. Taylor probably doesn't have a queen there versus small bet. But versus large bet, he's still going to have some queen X. So when Taylor does call here, because Chris upsized, Taylor has a stronger overall calling range. And mm-hmm. Taylor folding that jack is very, very reasonable, especially if he thinks uh, Chris's turn barrel range for that size is mostly going to be pretty strong, which would be a pretty reasonable assumption. Yep. Yep. We got a comment in the chat about uh, my Canadian accent. Yes, that's right. I'm coming in, coming in from Canada, y'all. And I'm actually, I was joking earlier, drinking Diet Coke tonight. Got to keep the brain sharp. No Grolsch on the job. I'm going with uh, Mountain Dew Zero for me. There you go. Got to get like a sponsorship opportunity for that. <laughs> I, I'm desperate to get some Grolsch money. Come on, Grolsch, come at me. <laughs> so this uh, five nine suited, he limped at preflop. I'd much rather just raise it at the stacked up. You know, the thing is, is that it's very, very, very difficult to be playing against an opponent where just raising every button is going to be bad. Mm. You know, it, it usually if we're like deeper than 25 big blinds, you almost always just want to raise essentially every button mm. unless our opponent is very, very, very good or very, very, very like exceptionally aggressive. And by good, I mean, like, I know Taylor is good, but you know, like an elite heads up single red. Those are the people that you actually start folding some buttons to or limping more in spots that you normally wouldn't limp. Mm. So I do like, like what I was talking about before, like using a hand like Jack nine suited as a three bet, especially the stacked up is a perfectly reasonable hand to do. The only part I dislike about it is that he just three bet a little too small. Mm. He went 2.7 X, which they're 80 big blinds deep and he's out of position. He wants to go at least four X here. 
Tens. King 10 suited has some great options on the flop. Probably going to want to generally lean towards calling, but if you have a hand like ace jack or ace six or pocket sixes, you have a really good candidate to raise, you know, you want to be able to raise those. And if you want to be able to raise those, you want, also want to use hands like King 10 suited that have this added equity to raise flop as well. Ooh, that's a weird run out. Um, <laughs> Taylor definitely got lucky that it's a pretty obvious, you know, full house slash quad scenario. Um, you know, if, if, if Chris had needed like, a, you know, an ace jack or a pocket jack to, ha to have him beat, it would have been a, a really rough spot. Like if it was a nine of clubs river, this is just game over. Mm -hmm. Instead, Chris is just hoping that Taylor has a strong hand and he kind of does, but he also has a pure bluff catcher. And on this river card, you don't really want to have, a king and a 10 in your hand because what types mm. of hands are chris going to be willing to like barrel down on there mm -hmm. cards that block jack 10 cards that block king jack cards that unblock flushes so you want those are the types of cards you want your opponent to have so taylor probably just going to have a fold here especially if chris could also be going for value here with an ace but let's say taylor doesn't think chris will jam an ace here then taylor actually has a pretty easy call because he's either bluffing or has quads and if he thinks he's capable of bluffing then he can just find a hero there yep i do think that was a good fold and now you can see the chips are distributed a little yeah. differently we're down to about 7500 2500 so this should be a very fireworks type of flop chris flopping top harry is a very strong hand taylor has a great hand to use as a check raise because this hand doesn't really like a lot of turn cards but it can also pick up equity on a lot of cards and barrel on. So this three, nine works great as a check raise mm. because when you check raise it, you blow your opponent off of hands like ace high and king high and queen high that aren't really going to barrel very often. And then on top of that, you can turn good equity versus this like seven X. You could have a turn be a four where you rep a five or turn be a five where you rep a four, or you also pick up added equity on top of that. You can also turn equity on, threes uh threes fives eights nines tens spades which when your hand can turn that much equity but is very vulnerable in its own right it works great as a check raise mm -hmm. so this three actually uh yeah i was gonna say this three would make a lot of sense to use as a bluff lead i wouldn't have shoved but i do like the bluff uh, i do like bluffing as an idea there i think he just took it a little too far um, the only issue I have with it is that, you know, chances are if Chris has a six, he's probably just going to get forced into a call. So you kind of want to bet there to force the ace and king and queen highs and stuff like that. So I'd much rather have led like a third pot. Um, if you are going to use it as like a, a jam, I might check jam it instead mm. just because it would look a lot stronger. Um, but I do like the idea of the bluff. I just think that you know, he saw a great spot and got excited and went for it, which is good to see, but he definitely ran into it, which is really unfortunate. Yep. Yep. Uh, I, and both these guys, they've got, uh, I said this last week, they've got the heart of the lion. They're not going to be afraid to, uh, to put it in there and to try and uh, put a spot. So um, I, yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised they're going to seize some opportunities to take it away, uh, take it away from their opponent. So one down. Chris has uh, claimed the early victory. We got some, I, I want to respond to some comments in the uh, chat here. First of all, one of my favorites, Rick Day, who's again saying, you know, yeah, Jim's got this Canadian accent, but you wouldn't know it when you read his book. And that's right, Rick. That's right. Thanks for pointing that out, buddy. Um, and uh, Window Guy 1954 says Chris caught some really nice hands. Um, <laughs> BGM in 96 also likes that fold. I thought that was very disciplined. And yeah, we got some other, I'm glad people are having fun here in the chat. Uh, and, uh, and some, uh, we says Ryan explains poker very well. Best coach in the industry. How Thank about you. that? There really appreciate go. that. Not wrong. Not wrong at all. So uh, one down. And, and I think, was there, was there, um, was there anything about that match that made you feel like, oh, okay, we're going to be, looking for this in this next match i think some of the pre-flop like the three bet sizing maybe is i mean that's that... that's more something that they were both doing taylor was definitely going a little bit bigger than chris so both of them looked like they just had a size that would that they would generally go with and they stuck with it which is good to see like when you pick a three bet size especially in a spot like this you just you generally just want to stick to it um it's a 
it's a lot harder to get way, away with some of like the three bet sizing exploits that I use in tournaments because mm -hmm. you know when you're playing versus one opponent and you're playing so many hands you know a, an obvious pattern like that can become pretty clear so it's good to see that they're both sticking to uh, specific sizes honestly both uh post flop there's nothing that I like obviously picked up on or saw from either of them um same with pre-flop really the only thing was just that they're both going a little bit too small, which can certainly cause some issues uh, post-flop for them because their opponent will be calling too much, which will just make it harder on them. Yeah, and it makes it it makes it harder to predict their ranges too, right? Because then they're not um, they're not really folding as often, so their mm -hmm. range continues uh, wide, which makes it harder right. um, harder to to range them. So I, I exactly. see a note in here that uh, maybe my mic is a little loud. I can't actually change the audio setting midstream, apparently, but uh, I've moved it off here, Roger. So let me know. Yeah, if and that's... I can try to make mine a little louder, too. <laughs> All right. There we go. You never know. And balance it out a little. That's right. I'll, I'll move this off to see, a little, see if that makes a little bit of a difference. So... So here we are, we've got uh, match number two. The, the combatants have had a little bio break. They've taken some deep breaths and here they are, they're getting ready to get back at it. And uh, we've got Chris in the bottom again here and uh, Taylor up in the top left. So Chris Pop almost got his favorite hand, so close. Yeah, very close. And, and Taylor here actually has a pretty powerhouse of a hand heads up. You know, you wouldn't really uh, imagine eights as being like that great. But when you only have one other opponent and they're raising ranges like, you know, 90, 95% of hands, that, that means eights is going to be very, very, very good, which as we see, Taylor is very aware of that and does go for this three bet. Looks like he's rebetting to 245, which he's stuck with the exact same size, which is, that's at least very good to see. Um, you know, you're, he's not like going smaller when he has like weaker hands right. or upsize or anything like that. He's just like pick the size and has stayed balanced with it. Um, I actually, as Chris with that six, five, and this is why going that small can be a mistake is because that six, five becomes a very clear call there, mm. you know, but if, mm -hmm, if Taylor mm -hmm. was going larger then the six, five is like pretty marginally justified kind of going either way, depending on the opponent. Yep. I like that. That's a good point. And it's interesting to see how your sizes, um, they do contort the range of your opponents, right? And that's, yes, that's you know, you can use that for that power for good or evil, and whether you're doing it on purpose or not, you're mm -hmm. doing it. Uh, so right. it's a really important thing to be thoughtful about. So pre-flop and flop with both ranges being very wide, you know, the way in which you really start to break down what someone can have is really on turns and rivers. So mm. even in like these heads up matches, it can kind of become somewhat, I would say obvious, but somewhat more clear the types of hands someone might have in a spot. I actually think Taylor should have check raised flop with this four seven of hearts. And if he is going to check call, he definitely needs to turn it into a bluff on this river because he doesn't really have any showdown. Um, mm. It's also like a hand like this four seven, he could turn a lot of equity and still get blown off of it. Like turn could have been a five and Chris just bombs it. That's why like you want to use hands like that as check raises be, so you can blow off your opponent off of a hand like that three eight of clubs and you can just take it down and yeah. if if you are going to check call it you need to be aware that like on the river you don't really have any showdown whatsoever which just makes it a really good bluff candidate yep and i think people um you know rec, rec players particularly kind of underappreciate how mm -hmm. important it is to get those folds from those hands that yep. you know we all think about oh i wanted to get a, i wanted to fold a pair i wanted to fold a draw right. like the actually it's really valuable if you just get them to fold some of those over cards or mm -hmm. those you know some cards that you just don't want to see um get help on a later street uh and i think yep. that makes us play more passively because we're not we're mm -hmm. not aggressive enough trying to get people to make those folds right exactly uh an aggression heads up really is king yeah so this king deuce i really like the flop check call the reason why we check call flop with this is because this king deuce can turn equity on a lot of cards that taylor is going to want to barrel on and so like if mm. he turns a queen we can check call a lot more comfortably having that gutter ball to go with or if we turn the king and taylor barrels we now can like check call down. I actually wouldn't have led the river. Um, the way that I decide whether or not I'm going to lead in the spot comes down to whether or not a card is very good for me or not. Hmm. And the river king is one of the best cards for Taylor. And because that's one of the best cards for Taylor, it's going to be one of his best bluff candidates as well. So that 10-5 might actually have bluffed the river and hmm. Chris missed out on both a bluff catch opportunity or a river check raise for value opportunity, which mm. I actually would have used his hand as a river check raise. Mm. 
and looks like Chris just might be one and dunning this, um, which again, that seven, eight actually works pretty well, at least as a double barrel. I wouldn't triple barrel, but I would definitely double barrel because for heads up, you're also trying to get things like ace high to fold, jack high to fold. And we just saw Taylor check called flop with seven high. And if your opponent's going to ever have stuff like that in their hand, then they're going to be folding often enough to a double barrel. So this ace queen should be a pretty clear three bet. And Chris is going to have a very easy call here with this king jack suited. Both of these are powerhouses pre-flop. King jack suited doesn't really want to four bet very often here. It works fine as a four bet, but usually it's just such a good hand to call in position. We're generally just going to want to call it. Uh, pretty interesting board. So there's lots of hands that both players can have that are very, very strong here. And even this King Jack of Diamonds is still actually pretty strong because mm -hmm. the King Jack of Diamonds can turn equity on King, Queen, Jack, 10, 9, and Diamonds. So this board texture is not that wet, but it's very dynamic. And even for the situations, it's pretty dynamic too. So as Chris there actually would have called flop very happily um, with the intention of running some bluffs on, you know, turn cards where we turned equity. Because, like, I'm not just going to have King Jack here. Let's say the turn is a six of diamonds. I now have a very good card for my range where my hand also picks up equity. And on that, that type of turn card, if Taylor bets into me, I get to raise. And if he checks into me, I get to bomb it. So no matter what he does, I'm going to put him into a really rough spot on the turn. And that'll turn into a lot of really rough river spots, too. Mm. There's going to be very few rivers that he's going to not have to find a very big catch, uh, bluff catch with. So say seven hearts going to be a really good raising counter, of course. So nine, eight off at this depth, you generally want to be pretty careful with using these offsuit hands as three bets, mm. even heads up. You know, if you're consistently three betting these offsuit candidates playing super deep and out of position, they lose a lot of their playability just because of how deep you are. You know, these middling type hands work better as three bets when you're shallow or effective. Yeah. And we look, we, we saw that seven, eight um, of hearts being a good example of a yep. three bet candidate at that stack depth. Is there, do you go down from there as well? Like seven, six, yeah. six, five, is there? So yeah, you would be using all those types of hands at pretty yeah. high frequencies as three bets. And then like, once we get down to that 30 to 40 big blind range or 50, even 50 big blind range, I'm going to be a lot more willing to use a hand like nine, eight off instead, mm -hmm. because when you're at that stack depth, you know, they open to two bigs, you three bet to seven, they call. Now 14 big blinds pot in the pot, 40 back. You're not playing that deep effective, so you can get stacks in pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So this queen 10 works pretty well both ways. Uh, jack nine on the flop works great as a check or a bet. You know, this hand, if you bet and get check raise, you can't really continue versus check raise, which kind of sucks. Mm. But you also only have jack high, so if you bet and they fold, it's pretty good for you as well. Yeah. Uh, this queen 10 works really well as a call or check raise as well because the queen high can just be good or you can just check raise and blow your opponent off of hands with a lot of equity that might check back on turns a lot mm. so this jack nine on this turn king works great 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 as a double barrel because your opponent isn't going to have a king super often they're mostly going to have an eight they could have some ace highs they could have some queen highs they could have some like bare draws and you know if they have a five and they check raise you here it doesn't matter like you have a mm. hand that's a very easy give up so you unblock some of the hands that they're folding, and then you also block some of their strongest king highs and ace highs, which just makes it a really good barrel candidate. This heads up comes like nice and quick, but you still can like have a pretty good idea as to how these ranges should interact. If you're constantly thinking in terms of who has range advantage and what cards are good or bad for each of us. And when yeah, that, in those terms, that's that's what makes it a lot easier and a lot quicker. Chris was actually uh, just leading our our newest rec poker learning seminar, which mm -hmm. was we've been started. We, we've been kind of building on some um, some principles. So we were talking about ranging. We were talking about board textures mm -hmm. and then we were talking about uh, post flop betting lines. And it's like the more the, the more work you do on ranging the easier it is to look at flop textures and board textures right. and see who's who's favored by them. Mm -hmm. And so the easier it is to play against opponent ranges and the easier it is to see these betting lines that don't quite make sense mm -hmm. um, when you look at the whole other picture. So it, it's really like, a, it's like a learning a language. You really have to definitely. Oh, be definitely. steeped in it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. It, like learning and getting good at poker is a lot like learning and getting good at math. 
Mm. And like it's oh, it great. really is like learning a, <laughs> it really is like <laughs> or like learning and getting good at, at any language really. It really is yeah. like learning a new language. Um, and it, it just takes lots of hard work and lots of time and effort and lots of repetition um, and just lots of consistent studying. Um, there, you really can't these days just like hop into the game and just use raw playing ability and raw just you know grinding to become one of the best. Mm -hmm. um, there are there's essentially no one that does that these days. It's not like you know poker isn't like it was back in 2004 or anything like that. Yeah. So this is a pretty good board for both of our opponents. Taylor, being the preflop raiser, has a really good range advantage. And he also like blocks some pretty strong hands, he blocks a lot of hands that continue. So he actually has a really good flop C bet. And Chris is going to have a pretty easy call call mm -hmm. uh, and even might, might even have like a triple call down. So if this ace deuce I actually would have C bet and then barreled down. And then Chris probably would have called flop, called turn. And this Queen River is one of the worst cards for uh, for Chris. So he's probably actually just going to have a pretty easy check fold, even to this bet bet. Mm. And I think, you know, again, that's something that we don't think about enough is that uh, there's, it's, there's actually, it's, it's good if people are going to call the flop and then fold on a later street, yes. because then you win more chips than if you, exactly. had, if they had just folded in the first place. So there's a real art to the sizing of, mm -hmm. you know, that first bet, make it callable enough that they can kind of define the range a bit, put some mm -hmm. more chips in, and then you can take it away later with the, with a bigger bet and you win a bigger pot. And also these hands, like these bottom pairs, they're very vulnerable. You know, let's mm. say Chris has a hand like eight, nine, and we check back. Car turn cards that we dislike are sixes, sevens, eights, nines, <laughs> jacks, yeah. queens. Yeah. Well, queen, not so much. But the rest of those, that eight, nine picks up equity, and we just give them free equity. It's way better for us to just bet and take it down with that. Mm. Yeah, it's all winning a hand is always good. Yes, consistent of pressure is what makes you money whether you're playing tournaments cash games whatever it's just toning down that pressure and making sure you're careful and you know in, in the bigger spots being more careful and controlled that's like the difference between like a good aggressive player and a weaker aggressive player mm. this queen seven works great as a check call or a check raise um it the queen high is probably going to be good by itself but you can also turn some equity with that seven in your hand and you block some things as well so you can check raise to try to get ace and king highs to fold on flop and then barrel a lot of turn cards, get them to fold there. Also try to get a hand like queen jack or queen 10 or queen nine to fold, or even hands like this or hands like jack nine, jack seven. So I, I would have leaned towards check raising this, but I don't mind the flop check call and turns really close and really gross. Um, that just shows like the power of position, the power yeah. of aggression and the power of range advantage. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, the, when, when, the more you play poker, the more you sort of, you uh, internalize that kind of stuff and yes, you can, you exactly. can feel it at the table too. And you're like, Oh, that's just not a good card for me. And right. And yeah. if you're constantly thinking about that stuff, it becomes more natural. Mm -hmm. So like, like, you know, once you learn a concept, it doesn't really matter what the concept is. Let's say, you know, you're a little kid learning how to ride a bike, you know, everyone kind of remembers to some degree what that felt like, you know, it's very you know, scary and weird and new, and it's not something that comes naturally. But, you know, now you can just hop on a bike and not even thinking about it. Right. And that's what you need to do with poker to really get to a higher level is to be constantly thinking about these new concepts that you're learning. Yeah. So this A6 preflop works pretty great as a call or three bet. On flop, it's generally going to be a good check call candidate. Um, you generally don't really want the ace in your hand when you are going mm. for these flop check raises. You usually want your opponent to to have those ace x as well. On top of that, you're generally going to want to use it as a good uh, bluff catch because if the turn's an ace, it's going to be a card they're going to want to barrel at. Yep. So this turn eight is a great card for Taylor to lead on because this six is a very vulnerable hand, and you know it, he could pretty easily have some seven x candidates. He can tons of seven X in his reign. You could also pretty easily have some two pairs and stuff that want protection and even some top pairs as well. So the six ends up being a great candidate to use as a bluff. And then he can bluff catch with his like two pair candidates with his pair and higher straight draw candidates. And instead use a hand like one of his few bare pairs with no extra equity as a bluff candidate. Mm. He would have mm -hmm. ran into it, but it would definitely have been a really good turn lead for like 30 to 40% pot and then a good river bet on a lot of different river cards. And again, yeah. this 3-4 works great as a flop C bet because it's a pretty vulnerable hand. You know, when you check 
a hand like this three, four back, there's a lot of turns that are very, very bad for you. Um, and when your opponent check calls, that's going to be pretty good for you. There's some that you get to barrel on, some you get to check back. And if they check raise you, you also get to call it because you can still turn equity on a lot of different cards. Mm. So anytime a hand is vulnerable, but has pretty good overall equity, it's usually going to make a very good C bet. If like if you're ever worried about over C betting, just don't be because it's very, <laughs> very, very difficult to do. Yeah. Um, and if they're like, let's say you only ever check back, and when you check back, you're purely trapping and doing nothing else. It's going to be perfectly fine unless you're, you know, playing against the same people all the time. Right. Yep. And I think that's part of it is, you know, we talked earlier about like targeting that aggression, like using mm. it controlled, picking your spots. And I think that's the key. Um, I think a lot of recreational players uh, just feel like, okay, I got to be aggressive and they don't think about sizing and they don't think right. about like the right range and texture mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, so that is real part of the art is, is knowing where, where to go for it and where to hold back. Yeah. But like uh, for flops, you don't really need to worry too much about any mm. of that stuff. You can just like pretty blindly bet. I'm writing that down. Like, Ryan said yeah. I could pretty blindly bet. He you said can. it. <laughs> because like, one of the main things is that our opponents make a couple of main mistakes versus us. Generally, they weigh under check raise, and that's like one of the most important things. Mm. So because they weigh under check raise, just betting everything becomes very, very profitable. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If you ever have like a close bot as whether or not you should bet or not, see bet or not, just see bet. It's, it's <laughs> almost it. always going to be a good decision. <laughs> Potential approved. Yeah. There we go. Love it. That's nice. And uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about on Saturday is your uh, defending against C bets uh, yes. video and material there. And I think you, you just nailed it earlier. Um, players don't check raise enough. They just Nowhere don't. Near enough. Uh, not on the flop. Certainly not on on future streets. But so Chris here actually has a really good candidate to check raise. Because mm. what turn cards does Chris like legitimately like? Like his hand only actually likes sevens and eights. Everything else is kind of shitty. Actually, turn queen's a pretty good card for him too. So this hand actually is a great turn lead. And the reason why it's a great turn lead is because when Chris check calls, he's going to have a king a lot. He's going to have a seven lot. He's going to have a queen a lot. And he has a lot of king and queen X. And his king X generally want to lead to some degree. And his queen mm -hmm. X all want to lead. And his seven X all want to kind of lead for protection. And with, with the seven X, you can, with all of those hands, you can lead small. And then with the seven X and queen X, you can turn them into really, really large river bets. So I would have led turn for like a third pot and then I would have over potted the river. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's really uh, one big difference because we, we do at the end of each month, we sort of do a final table review with some mm -hmm. of our premium members. And I just love talk. I love the way you're talking about the individual hands in the range and how they play differently. And I think that's something recreational players really need to pay attention to is visualize the entire range there and how you would act in, in all those different that's ways. A, so. You don't actually need to visualize the entire range. You actually only need to just go, is this card good or bad? Like the simplest form of it is just, is this good or bad for me? Mm. And at that stage, you can use that information to build strategy around it. Mm. It's just, if you want to play at an incredibly high level, then visualizing the whole range and stuff, like visualizing the whole range is the end game. Like that's the level you want to get to. But in terms of just like making good strategic decisions, even just simple of who's that advantage and what's like, is this card good or bad for me? Like just doing that is going to be really, really simple. Mm. So mm -hmm. Steve has a question. <laughs> Ryan, are you a genius? So <laughs> actually... Um, ironically, uh, like when I started playing poker in junior high, um, like, you know, we'd do sleepovers and there'd be halo and poker, you know, we'd, you know, do land parties and we'd play poker. And I was honestly one of the worst players in the game, like legitimately just one of the worst players in the game. So it's not like I was a, you know, a crusher back then. I, I was never like naturally good at poker. And as I like moved up the ranks, I never was like, I never found it like naturally easy or anything like that. It was always very difficult for me. Um, this is really just years of hard work and mm. studying a lot and talking to people that are way better at poker and way more intelligent than me and working with friends and working with the community. You know, the power of community shows, you know, I really do show the power of community because <laughs> if I didn't have those people around me, I wouldn't be the player that I am today. Yeah. 
That's great. more about just working hard and grinding than it is anything else. Mm -hmm. People don't want to know that, but it's true. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I was very far from it. And, and at no point did I ever feel as though I was like naturally great at something. Um, PLO is kind of like the exception, but even that I only got pretty good at PLO after I got really good at Polym Omaha High Low from getting coached in it. And mm. then as my Hold'em game really improved, then I just got better at thinking about Polym Omaha. And, you know, also I've just ran pretty good at some pretty important times, which <laughs> also helps a lot. It does. It does. Now I, I, I just play Hold'em. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that uh, dabbling, not that more than dabbling, but, but learning some of the other games, has that helped you with your Hold'em game as much as if you just spent that time working on Hold'em or is it like a different Maybe way of Maybe not learning? as much, but it, it's, it definitely helped a decent amount, especially uh, flop games help a lot. So this is a really interesting spot. Um, Taylor has an amazing check raise hand because not only does he have this up down straight draw, he also has that extra club in his hand, mm. which makes his hand a lot better to barrel with. Um, there's just going to be a lot more cards that he's going to very comfortably barrel on. And he actually can barrel pretty comfortably on this turn queen of diamonds. And then he can triple barrel on rivers, five, sixes, nines, tens, and clubs. Um, probably wouldn't want to do it on a Jack cause that's going to give, uh, Chris too many, two pairs and stuff, mm. but all those cards are going to be really, really good for, for Taylor. So I actually would have kept betting. Um, and I would have kept betting to also target that seven, eight type hands, um, and any seven X, any eight X, uh, type hands, as well as in this lower draw, I would have bomb turn and gotten this to fold instead now because we didn't bet now we rivered some equity and allowed right. our opponent to suck out on us mm. that's why like aggression is really important and continued aggression is also incredibly important yeah um, given given the delay it looks like this is going to go bet raise oh he did he does check so the river nine for taylor works pretty well as a check because you beat those seven eight you know mm. those seven x and eight x hands but also works really 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 good as a bomb because you block all the two pairs and you block some straight candidates uh chris actually should have just bet the river uh just because there's plenty of hands that taylor can have that are check calls uh like te technically the six nine works pretty well as a check call or as a check raise um i'd probably check raise it that's kind of the downside of betting the five six but when you do bet the river mm. and your opponent check raises you, you can just go, is my opponent capable of having worse? If so, you call. And then if they're not capable of having worse for value, then just are they capable of bluffing a lot? And if they are, then you can also find the call. Yep. Yep. You don't want to ever check the river just because you're worried about what they might do. Yes. You instead want to keep betting your value hands and keep, keep just pushing good equity. Mm. You know, one of the most important things really that you can do it just bet, bet, bet your equity. Make sure you're pushing that those really good high equity hands. Yeah, and just because you're betting doesn't mean you can't fold to a raise, right? Like it's appropriate yeah. to have a folding range um, in the, in part of that betting range. And I think we don't, uh, again, players like in our player pool, um, they're not betting thinly enough. They're not value betting thinly enough because right. they're worried about, oh, well, what if they have a better hand? Well, then just fold to the raise. Right, exactly. Uh, window says it appears Chris is catching a ton of rivers. Is there a way of stopping this and not allowing him to get there? So that was actually something that was else that I was bringing up was, you know, if Taylor had barreled that six, nine, he would have won that hand. Mm. If he'd gone, you know, two thirds pot, like I would have in game, he would have pushed him off that added equity. Um, and he would have, you know, just taken it down right there. Uh, but also you can't really too, be too worried about, Oh, this person's been running good. So they're going to keep running good. You know, variance doesn't have a memory. Things just happen <laughs> or they don't. Um, so yeah. I actually really like Chris or sorry, Taylor upsizing the river and really going for it because he wants to essentially say, Hey, I have a hand like 10, nine or six, five of clubs, or I have a monster and nothing in between that like most realistically reps that you're bluffing or have it. And then Chris just needs to decide whether or not you're capable of bluffing mm -hmm. or capable of bluffing enough when you choose that size. And I actually like the size a lot. So this ace four is a great check call candidate. Um, let's say you had five, four, four, seven, or four, three, or mm. six, five, or six, three. Those hands you want to check raise. Because now this ace turns some pretty deceiving equity here. Having this ace of spades blocker. Now, if like Taylor did decide to triple barrel and the river was like the eight of spades, if he triple barrels, you have a great check jam candidate mm. or check raise candidate because you're mm -hmm. blocking the strongest hand that he can have. 
realistically. Um, so turn, I would actually call here pretty comfortably. Even though we're blocking the ace, queen, ace, jack hands, we're unblocking seven, five, seven, eight, eight, nine, nine, seven, jack, nine, hands like jack, eight, hands like queen, jack, and queen, nine. Um, using this as a check raise is a really good option too. Uh, as long as you're not folding on this turn card, I like both. And I like mm. this size a lot too. You know, it's going to put this king five in a really difficult and awkward spot. Um, even if even if Taylor has a hand like king six, he's not going to be like too thrilled about it. So the only issue with check raising this turn is a card like this, where you now technically block his strongest hand possible. You block ace king, you block aces, you block ace queen, but Taylor can still have lots of two pair type hands. You like to fall through on this river. You're going to want like a river three, a river five, a river mm. seven, a river eight, a river spade, stuff like that's going to be really good candidates to follow through on. So even though we don't have any showdown here, I really like this give up. This is a disciplined check. That's, I feel as though that that's one of the types of mistakes people do is when they do play aggressively, they get married to pots. They're like, oh, I've risked yes. all of this. And I block these hands. Okay, I'm going to go for it. When really, it's just not a good card. Like, And really, my thinking there had nothing to do with visualizing his range or anything like that. It was strictly just, is this a good card for me? Yes or no? And yeah. when the answer is no, it's just much easier to go, oh, this is a bad card for me. I can give up. I you love that. Then, you can make it a lot easier and add all this other stuff to it, thinking about, well, make it more in depth and have a better idea as to why it's a no. But all you really truly need to play pretty well is, is this good or bad for me and make decisions around that. So let's, I want to ask you about that a little bit because there was a question here in the chat. Um, I think it was from we uh, about trying to find better spots to do check raising. And I mm -hmm. feel like check raises are another spot where it's like, okay, is this good for my opponent's range? Is this good right. for my range? Is this good for my hand? So when, when you're, uh, we is asking like mm -hmm. how to find those better spots. W so what are good check raise spots? You generally want to check raise more often on either really dynamic boards or pretty static uh, paired boards that are like the low middling cards. So like, you know, four, four X, five, five X, six, six X, seven, seven X, those types of boards mm -hmm. that are really good for the big blind defend. Great check raise spots. Mm. And then on top of that board textures like King six, four, is a really good check raise because while well, your opponent can certainly have a king, they can also just be C betting their ace and queen and jack high and 10 high and stuff like that. And on top of that, the reason why a 6 4 type board is going to be really good because you can have a hand like 7 5 or 3 yes. 5 or 7 8. And then on top of that, you also have these weak and middling pairs that also just want to check raise for value and protection. Mm -hmm. So you can check raise in those on those board textures and have either these draws or these pairs, and you can rep all that. And then on top of that, you can also have king six and king four and six four and pocket fours and pocket sixes. So when it's a board texture that both of you can hit, but especially you, and then it's a board texture where the best hand possible is going to change a lot, those types of boards are going to be by far the best. Mm. So Taylor having the 10-5 off and Chris here having the pocket aces. So pocket aces pre-flop, an easy way to really think about them is that they work great as traps. And the reason why they work great as traps is because you block your opponent's main calling hands, which are the, the, the good ace highs. Um, on top of that, it's also the hands just aren't really vulnerable at all. And because they're not really vulnerable, that's also why they make really good traps. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever thinking about like whether or not you should trap preflop, just go, is this hand vulnerable? And a hand like pocket tens is very vulnerable. And the reason why a hand like tens is very vulnerable is because the likelihood an ace, king, queen, or jack hits on the flop is about 65%, which is really bad when you have pocket tens. But with aces, you know, if a king hits, that's great for you. It's wonderful. So these aces leading the river, it's going to be, a, I think, a perfectly fine thing. I actually would have checked this river because we, like, when our opponent checks twice or... Sorry, I'm turn might have gotten bet. Um, but no, yeah, maybe we led either way, whether we led the turn or it went check, check, check down. The river queen is really good for our opponent. So we want to give them that opportunity to right. bluff when they have their king tens and king jack. 
So because of that, I just would have checked the river and gone for actually a value check raise. You know, having aces with the ace of clubs, we block flushes. Yep. It's going to be a great spot to check raise because they can call us with king queen and queen jack and queen 10 and queen eight. And if they're folding the, if they're bet folding those hands, then what we can do is we can just check raise bluff rivers a lot more right. often. Yeah, I think we, we talk about this often at Rec Poker that, you know, people find they're in a spot and they're like, well, this is just a terrible bluff spot. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, then it's a good value bet spot. And if yeah. you're in a spot where it's like, oh, well, they're, they're never value betting here, uh, like Chris then make the it turn. a value bet. Yeah, even though Chris led the turn, I would have still trekked the river with those aces just because a queen is such a good card for Taylor's range. It's one of the best cards in the deck for his range. Mm -hmm. So this Jack 3-3. Three, three, the deuce, deuce, and three, three boards, I pretty rarely check raise except for like heads up because mm. our defense range heads up is a lot looser than if we are, say, you know, mid position opens and we're in the big blind. You know, we don't get anywhere near as many deuce X or three X as versus a button open, especially heads up versus a button open. Um, and I think the both of them checking down is very reasonable. The queen high is going to win pretty often. The king high is going to win pretty often. Mm -hmm. Neither of them really need to run a bluff. Uh, it's unfortunate that Taylor's flopping a set, especially on this type of board. Like generally, if you want to flop a set as a button, you want to flop it on like those middling connecting boards. So like uh, having deuces on like deuce five, nine is way better than deuces on deuce queen 10 here because the five, nine, Chris in particular is really more likely <laughs> to have those five X hands. <laughs> That's right, Chris, your reputation precedes you. <laughs> That's fantastic. So Chris going with the slightly smaller open, which is good to see. As you get shallower and shallower effective, you definitely want to open smaller and smaller, just from a general theory perspective. And is there a stack size at which you start to introduce more limping um, at this point? Um, or? I would generally say like 35, 40 on down. I, so theoretically speaking, even on the stack depth, you should have some limps. But I would generally just not be, just because I expect my opponents to weigh under three bet and to land or check raise post flop. So because of that, just consistently minning the button is just going to be very profitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in our pool, in our uh, player pools, a lot of people overfold to that mm -hmm. min raise too. So right. exactly. uh, we do see a lot of two Xing in our heads up, in our heads up battles. If, if you did want to have some limping hands there, when you got down to like 35 big blind range, what are the kind of hands you'd want to mix in there? So if you're introducing the limps heads up, you generally want to be limping pretty consistently. So I would like, if I'm limping at all, I'm going to be limping like, you know, 30 to 70% of mm. the time. Like it's going to mm -hmm. turn into a very high limp percentage. Um, same with like completing the small blind. Like if you're going to complete the small blind at all, you generally want to do it really often if you're doing it from a theory perspective. Now, obviously as an exploit perspective, you know, I'll just limp my somewhat weak hands, raise my strong hands and my super weak hands. And, you know, the, the stuff that I'm limping, I'm often just limp folding, which is how mm. I'm exploiting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm writing that down for when I get you in the home game on Sunday. Exactly. Well, <laughs> in that, I'm going to play a lot more balanced. I'll be way more protected. I'm not going to break out any of my exploits. Oh, yeah, the, occasionally. <laughs> yeah there's, no, gotta... there's no easy seats in that one anymore. Everyone's, everyone's a crusher. <laughs> so I like this three bet pre-flop, and I really like the flop C bet. Chris flopped a pair and a gutter ball. And while it was bottom pair and, you know, again, just a gutter, he's still blocking some of Taylor's strongest hands. So you mm -hmm. definitely don't want to fold there. Mm -hmm. And Taylor can still have plenty of bluffs. Taylor doesn't just smash that. And while, yes, there are some turn cards that Taylor's going to barrel on, you, you still just, you blocking strong hands becomes really, really important in terms of bluff catching. And that's another one of those things where you kind of have to be visualizing your opponent's range a little bit just to sort of see yeah. what are the kind of hands I want to be blocking, you know, do they even have right. this from pre-flop? Yeah. So constantly trying your best to visualize is really important. Like what I generally do is like when my opponent, you know, three bets me or calls or does anything in my mind, I have like that, you know, the RTP grid yes. and then like everything is highlighted as to what they could probably have. And then when they bet, then it, I go, oh, they're maybe checking some of these hands or they're, you know, they won't have these types of hands. So I'm steadily breaking apart and going down. And that makes it easier for me to keep in my mind what they could possibly have, what they might mm -hmm. be fluffing with. Uh, that mm -hmm. makes my decisions a lot easier, but you and don't so, need to take it that far. 
And so are you keeping it in mind throughout the hand and sort of like constantly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because if you're keeping in mind throughout the hand, like, let's say you're not, let's say you just, you know, see them do something and then you're like, okay, what happened pre-flop? Oh, what could right. Have? Okay. What happened on flop? Crap. Shit. I don't remember. Uh, did I think they were strong or not? You're thinking about these like 4 trillion different things at the same time. And you're trying to remember. Well, mm -hmm. instead I see someone open and when I see them open, like glowing above their head live is like a grid of what the range looks like based off of how long I've been playing with them, that type of stuff. And then let's say they see bet. And then that grid changes based off the flop texture and the sizing they choose and who the player was. And then, you know, when they barrel the turn or whatever, I'm able to keep that in my mind. I don't have mm. to recreate it or try to create it after the fact. If mm. you're trying to like visualize things too far down, it, it's obviously going to be way more difficult than if you're just keeping track of the hand step by step by step by step. And even then you don't need to do a good job at it. You just need to go, oh, well, they opened pre-flop, so that means they're pretty strong. They see bet flop and the, this board texture. So these are the hands they might bet with. And then they barrel turn. Okay, now is this turn card good for me or good for them? Oh, it's good for them. They're probably going to barrel more often and have more bluffs. Oh, it's good for me. Oh, why are they barreling it? Why did they mm. choose this sizing? Like, you know, why are they betting this card so happily? Oh, it's probably because they either A, have an incredibly strong hand or B, have a really good bluff. And then on the river, when it's a really good card for them, then it's, oh, they're going to be more willing to bluff. So I just need to decide if they're capable or if it's a good card for me, then why are they betting this? Oh, is my hand that's normally pretty strong weak now because they're betting a board that's good for me. Mm -hmm. So like, you don't even need to do this stuff to play at a high level. It's just, as you're consistently doing this, it becomes easier and easier and easier and easier. And it's not something I need to really think about. And, and oftentimes I'm not even like, especially when I'm playing live, I'm not really going, oh, what hands has this person played before? Instead, you know, for those that have seen a bunch of LPP content, I have that player grid that shows that, you know, they're like, oh, in the top left means that they're tight, you know, tight aggressive and top right means they're really loose aggressive. Bottom left means they're really tight passive. Bottom right means they're really loose passive. I'm more just going, what have I seen this person do that makes me think they're X style? Mm -hmm. And what, you know, do I have I seen them do that makes me think their X ability, you know, what history do I have? And then everything from there becomes pretty simple. Mm. So this turn seven is a great card for Taylor to lead because the turn seven is one of the best cards in the deck for his range, especially the seven of clubs in particular. It's probably, it's probably one of the best cards, if not the best cards in the deck, being a club actually isn't that good for him, but just being a middling board pairing cards, wonderful him for him. So like, for Taylor's range on the turn, the best cards are tens, nines, eights, sevens, sixes, and fives. And then some clubs are, are pretty good. Like the higher clubs are actually better for him. So a uh, seven of clubs being such a good card, it's actually a card that he's going to want to lead on. And then because it's a club, he was going to want to lead somewhat large on. So mm. I actually would have led the turn for like two thirds pot. And then I would have bluffed the river. So I actually would have lost a pretty big pot there, but I would have done so going, oh, this is such a good card for me and I'm going to get a lot of folds and I would have gotten those king highs and ace highs and 6x and 9x, those types of stuff to fold on the river. While Taylor, when he you know check calls and doesn't leave the turn, he's missing out on pushing out those ace and king highs and those big draws that you know normally wouldn't be winning there. But instead, he just auto loses on showdown to everything, essentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this board texture is very good for the opener. The reason why it's very good for the opener is because it's a very static ace high board. So this 5-4 of hearts is actually a really good seabat candidate. And then Chris doesn't actually want to check raise here. Um, these monotone board textures, these very static boards, aren't really the best to check raise very often on. Uh, this turn eight of diamonds is now a really good card for Chris to lead on occasionally. But because it's a monotone flop, uh, it's such a static flop, he doesn't want to lead too often on it. But if I was going to lead, I would actually use a hand like this queen 10 with the queen of spades. Hmm. Now that uh, Taylor is barreling, this queen of spades actually turns into a really, really good check raise or check call. Uh, either works pretty well because the queen might actually be good by itself. The seven's probably good. The jack's probably good. Now this river five of diamonds is a great lead card for Chris. This is a wonderful, wonderful lead card because uh, while Taylor might have some 7X, 
Chris is going to have a lot more seven X than him. Mm. So because of that, he's going to want to lead. And while yes, flushes are possible, sevens are the most common car. Like sevens are going to be way more common. Also things like two pairs, stuff like that. And the way that Chris protects that is he leads a seven X. He leads those big brick draws. And then he also leads a bunch of flushes. And then he can call the seven X that have a spade in them. And he can call all of his flushes versus jams. And that's mm. all he needs to do to protect his range. Mm. So this ace five ten boards a really good check raise board because it's a pretty dynamic board for heads up, and this queen eight works great as a check raise as well or a check call. The queen might be good enough by itself to just ha- be the best hand, so you can check call it because of that, and you can turn equity on a lot of cards. You turn equity on kings, queens, jacks, nines, eights, and diamonds, so it works pretty good as a check call or as a check raise. I'd yeah, probably a- lean towards check raising it though. It's amazing how in these, uh, when you get heads up, you end up promoting so many of these hands that you would right, normally exactly. not want to consider a value hand. Um, just because your opening ranges are so wide, uh, it, the distribution changes drastically. Right. And it, it also strains, it also changes drastically in tournaments too, because let's say you're up against a early position lead or an early position open. Then when they see bet there, that hand is pretty weak. If they're a uh, late position open though, then their C bet range is going to be, or sorry, it's pretty strong. If they're a late position open, their C bet range is going to be a lot weaker. So the queen eight goes way up in value, excuse me. Mm-hmm. I'm just getting a note that the uh, the video might be lagging a little, but uh, yeah. hopefully the audio is coming through clean. If anyone's having any issues, just pop a note in the chat there and uh, we'll keep it up. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan LaPlante, head coach of LearnProPoker.com. Check it out. Um, Rec Poker actually has a really good uh, coupon code. If you use it, you can get $5 off per month. Um, I'm sure they can post it in chat and give it to you guys. Click on their link and support them as well. Yeah, please do. And uh, well, we want to be doing a lot of stuff together with Rec Poker yep, and uh, LPP. So it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but yeah, I believe if you use code uh, Rec Poker at purchase, then you get five bucks off a month forever, right? That's not just five bucks yep, off your no, first month. You're giving us five, five bucks off, off uh, for the life of the of the membership. That's very yep, generous. Thanks, Ryan. Exactly. And there's yep. so much good stuff over there. Um, it's well, well worth it, uh, folks. I encourage everyone to go and check I that out. I try my best to keep adding new content, different kinds mm. of content. Um, the newest video that's out for theory is a Poker Tracker 4 tutorial. Ah. Uh, part two is coming out um, in, on the first. And also on the first, we have the next part of our uh, heads up staking uh, thing that I'm doing with Poker Pastor with Rob Gardner. Um, and then we'll also have our weekly group session. So Lots of stuff that we're pushing out every single month. It's really impressive. And, and you, do, you guys do a great job. And, and your Twitter, your uh, Discord uh, platform is really great as well. There's lots of really good back and forth there. So uh, A, we have a pretty big cooler. But this is the board, type of board texture that Oof. when you're tailor, well, hitting quads is pretty nice too. <laughs> those are the boards that you want to flop sets on. Really <laughs> dynamic, connects with the big blind. So you can set up those check raises. And then bam, you show them the set, you river the quads, and you end <laughs> the map. <laughs> there you go. That's pro style right there. That's how you do it. So, uh, all right. So we're two matches down one a piece. Uh, it has been, there's been a lot of battle. Um, yes. it's been, uh, I, I like that. They're, they're both making some disciplined folds. They're both making some good, uh, bluffs. They're picking good spots. Um, and I, I just want to, I can't let this uh, five by five, uh, Chris himself put a little comment in the chat here. Uh, PT four tutorial is great. And I'm a huge PT4 nerd too. Um, so I love that. And I, and I think more people should be using Poker Tracker 4 and reviewing Definitely. their hands. And, uh, you know, people I don't think appreciate how helpful it is to just review your own data, mm-hmm. just to take an objective look at your own uh, play, whether you're using a HUD or not. Um, and you don't need Poker Tracker 4 to download your hand histories, but it's just, it, it's a great tool. And um, I, I have to recommend it heavily every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the best value poker product I've ever bought in both yeah. in terms as a player and as a coach. Just so mm-hmm. incredibly important. Yeah, strong, strong words. And yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, there's some, a lot of good programs out there, but that one's that one's the nuts. So, okay, so we're one each. Why don't we do one more um, dis- uh, prediction from the chat here? Uh, if anyone wants to put in um, who is going to win match number three, this is the final. Um, 
Yeah, John's John's going out on a limb again. Poker geek man. He's pretty sure he's got it narrowed down to Taylor or Chris. That's very brave, very brave choice, John. Um, always, always putting yourself out there. That's why we love you. Um, so we got a couple people other than John. <laughs> uh, Poker geek is being a good one about it. John Letzi says Taylor. Uh, Window guy says Taylor. Gibber, my buddy Jim has uh, Chris. And yeah, a shout out to Taylor, who's also been producing this Marek Madness the whole time. So um, whoever wins or loses, we're all winners because of the efforts that uh, Taylor Moss is putting forward. Throughout this. So thank you, Taylor. It's been fantastic. Um, I'm sticking with my Taylor guess, although I think both of them have been playing pretty similarly. Um, hmm. Both of them have like been being somewhat aggressive in lots of spots. Both of them have like missed some aggression in some spots. Um, both of them have gone for it in some pretty big pots, but both of them have also like toned it down in good spots to give up. So mm. I feel as though both of them are playing while they're obviously they have their own unique styles. They're playing pretty similarly overall, honestly. So it's, I obviously, I think they're very, very closely matched, but I'm just sticking with my Taylor. Yes. Yep. And I, I'm going to stick with Chris and just to keep it, keep it. I'm a loyal guy. It's just, it's how my mama raised me. It's just, uh, I got to stick. I got to dance with the girl. What brung me? So, um, uh, so let's actually just roll right into it. Uh, I think we got match three ready to go. And here we are. Final Taylor, match. Taylor keeps moving his seat. He, he doesn't like that. He's that unlucky seat uh, selection in the first time. He's scooting around. Here we go. All right. Let's get ready to battle. Let's get ready to rumble. All right. So this six, eight on the flop is a great check raise candidate. This is the type of board texture that I was talking about. Um, you know, it's, it's very dynamic board. And this six, eight turns equity on sixes, on five, sixes, sevens, eights, tens, um, and also clubs as well. Um, tens aren't the best, but you know, being able to turn equity in a lot of spots is really, really important in terms of picking a check raise candidate. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about, um, because the other, the other way to defend against C-bets, uh, we talked about check raising a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Talk, talk a little bit about donking. Uh, so you don't really want to lead very often. Uh, right. I just like calling it donking because donking gives it such a bad connotation. Um, but you don't really want to lead too often. Generally, the spots that you want to lead on are the boards where you're like, whoa, that's a me board. Those are the board textures that you really want to lead on. So like heads up, it's a little, there are more opportunities to do so because ranges are a lot more connected. So you just get more opportunities to do it. Um, generally in tournaments and cash games, you only really get to lead like those four five sixes type mm -hmm. boards, those super duper connected, super milling boards. Those are the boards you lead really, really often on. Um, generally turn leads. Those are really important. Turn leading is where the money is at yeah. because the turn leads become super duper powerful and important. Um, on like flop overall, if you've seen any of our, uh, flop material, uh, that I made with Acevedo. On flop, you only get to lead about 2% of the time overall. Hmm. Turn, though, you get to lead like 15 to 20% of the time overall, depending on the exact situation. Wow. So like this turn three, I actually would have led as Chris, because this is one of the best card strengths. Mm -hmm. so if I'm going to lead a card, I'm going to lead a three, and then I'm going to turn my five into a bluff on some rivers. So like, let's say the river is like a jack or a 10, I might actually overpot the river. Or if the mm. river is like an ace or a king, I might even consider overpotting as well, but I'd be less inclined on the ace. If I did overpot the ace, I would like, you know, really go for it. I wouldn't like, you know, you know, pussyfoot around here. I would like <laughs> really hammer. I would just go super duper duper hard on it. Yeah. You know, like 4X pot type stuff. Mm. Uh, so mm. Like the river king, Taylor showed really, really good hand reading ability. Going for the value bet, knowing that he was good and not being too worried about facing that check raise. And mm -hmm. Chris got stubborn and, and made a call. And I would have much preferred Chris to check raise the river. Mm. Like that's a spot where I'm actually not really going to call a five. I'm going to super bomb it or just fold. Mm. And, you know, I'd rather use that hand as a check raise candidate versus a calling candidate because you don't really want the nine in your hand. Um, having the five is fine, but it's not really a card that matters too much. Um, and also if you go for the check raise, you could get a queen to fold. You could get a king to fold. Um, so you have more opportunities to win. So 
trying to be a little bit more aggressive in certain turn and river spots is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. Mm. I would say like looking for good spots to lead turns and also looking for good spots to check raise rivers uh, and turns as well is super duper important. That's great. I, I, that my, the one thing everyone gets sick of me saying is that people don't two bet rivers enough. They just don't. Nowhere near and, enough. And, no, but, no, no, and, no, no, and they no. should. You should. People should yes, be two betting definitely. the river more. Um, so it's, it's, it's people don't expect it. it, it you, you can put them in some really difficult positions. Yes. And, and, and until they do, bet more. And, bet more yes. and don't be afraid to just definitely. confidently fold when they get raised. Yeah, like Taylor there could just bet fold pretty comfortably and not expect to be bluffed if Chris isn't bluffing a hand like nine, five, mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. if we're never bluffing one of our better hands to bluff with, then, you know, then he gets to just value bet very comfortably. Yeah. So this deuce three is a really good hand to check raise with. I'd rather have three, four, three, five, or three, six, but if I am going to use a deuce three candidate, I'm going to use it with those backdoor hearts. So I actually don't like check calling this spot at all. Mm. I want to go to like 260, 270 mm -hmm. because it's a very dynamic board texture. Best hand possible yeah. changes on fours, fives, sixes, sevens, eights, nines, tens, jacks, spades, board pair. So it's a lot of cards in the deck, best hand possible changes. It's king four being in position, being suited. It's really good calling hand. Chris now turning this added equity. He's definitely going to want to barrel pretty often. If he's not barreling it, I would check raise. So like yep. I would occasionally, I would generally barrel this, but I would occasionally check raise it. And I do like this size as two thirds pot. It's going to get a lot of folds and also gives us a pretty good price to get to the river. Taylor in position here is going to have a pretty easy call. Now this river six is actually a decent card for us. Um, it's not the best card for us. Like I'd rather a river four or river nine, even a river Jack, those types of cards were a lot more likely to have straights on river six. We're still pretty likely to have some straights. We can have nine, 10. We can mm -hmm. also have nine, five. We can have four, five. Um, so Using this three actually as a bluff is still pretty good because you block two pairs and you unblock his spade draws as well. So I would actually use this candidate as a triple barrel. Mm. Um, I... So Windows saying, keeping in mind, they only start with 5,000. So yeah, they only have quote unquote 5,000 in chips, but the, when the blinds are 1530, they're 166 big blinds deep effective. So that's a lot of playability. You know, the amount of playability you have isn't based off of what the starting chip number is because you can have a hundred million starting chips, but if you're starting at 5 million, 10 million, it's 10 big blinds, which is nothing. So this deuce three is a really difficult spot. You don't have a spade in your hand, which is really important. Um, you don't have a nine in your hand or a 10 in your hand or a jack in your hand. But on top of that, you also just have a pretty weak hand and he, especially for this 600 size, very easily be value betting like queen x of spades mm. or have like a seven eight or pocket tens or jacks or you know aces or kings or a set or a straight so <laughs> i like that sizing a lot by taylor he told a legitimate story on the river and got a hand to fold now if he had bombed the river chris might have actually been more likely to call because when you bomb it you polarize your range between just types of bluffs that he has and value hands and you're bombing that six you're saying you know you have these pretty specific hands which can be tough to have so chris might have gotten a lot more curious with this three which actually i would have liked to call a lot even on the river six as played i think calling and folding are both reasonable in game i might have just like flipped a coin and then called occasionally mm -hmm. folded the mm -hmm. rest of the time and do you use do you use a random generator like that, like a coin flip or? So if I'm playing with someone that I think is very good and aggressive, and I have a hand that I, I'm not super thrilled about calling, but I think I should occasionally call, I'll just use it then. Yep. So I would have preferred as Taylor who to bet the flop because if we get check raise on the flop, we have a pretty easy hand to call with since we turn equity on so many cards. Mm. Um, I like how Chris played it. I think at no point he should have done anything there. So this queen 10 preflop works great as a call or three bet works pretty well, both ways. Um, I like, I really like it both ways. And then on flop here, he actually just has a pretty clean call. Um, this queen high is going to be good a lot of the time. And it turns equity on a lot of cards that our opponent's going to want to barrel on. So mm. it works great as a call like this. Jack. Dink. It's actually <laughs> unfortunate for us that Chris has a hand with so much showdown. Like we'd much rather Chris have a hand like 10, nine or 10, seven hands like that. Oh, it looks like Chris is going for 
some thin value here. My guess is Chris is betting large here to target the, the weak ace X that we're chopping with and then hands like King, Queen, King, 10, King, nine, King, mm-hmm. uh, seven, six, five, four, three, two, which should all be calling at pretty high frequencies. Also now with Chris barreling, he doesn't have to worry too much about getting check raised when he goes this large and he can just check back the river. If he, you know, if the river is not a deuce or an ace essentially. I think Taylor for the most part should be check raising this because when Chris goes this big, I wouldn't expect him to just have an ace. I would expect him to have some really strong two pairs or a really big combo draw that I want to charge. The only issue with it though, is with this queen 10, we have the queen of hearts in our hand and the 10 of spades in our hand and we Mm. block those combo draws Mm -hmm. and we have good equity versus them. So that might lean me towards considering calling, but I really don't mind going for it either because when we have those cards in our hand, it makes it more likely our opponent just has a strong hand as well. Right. So right. I'd probably just check raise it as well. Yep. Pocket four is not really a hand you want to three bet with. Generally, you just want to call these for the most part. Uh, theory will occasionally three bet these, but I would in general just be calling them. Now this flop is a pretty good flop for the seven, eight. It's a good board texture for his range, and he has a hand that doesn't have a lot of equity. So it's just a great hand to bet. And if you get check raise, it's perfectly fine. If you get called, you can barrel on like a turn five. You can barrel on hearts. You can barrel on kings and aces and queens. Aggression is what wins. And simple aggression like C bets are really, really, really important because like that seven, eight would have just won on the flop. And could have, and if it didn't win on the flop, it could have won on a lot of turn cards. But when mm. he checks it back, he allows the pocket fours to show down a lot, which is really bad for him. At what stacked up with pocket fours be a three bet shove? Uh, because there's an ante and it's reasonable size in this, I would assume 40 big blinds, it would be a pure jam. Um, definitely 35 and less, I would pure shove it. So we were talking earlier about um, ranges and like we use Range Trainer Pro a lot. Uh, it's a really great training tool. It helps us visualize different opening ranges, particularly. Um, then what it, some of our members have talked about better ways to study when it comes to like bet sizing mm-hmm. or how to study textures. Um, do you have any ideas like good ways to other than just like getting it back into the textbook and doing the math? Mm-hmm. Is- well, so for studying like uh, textures, um, really that's just every time you see a board, you should be thinking how wet is it and how dynamic is it? Mm. The more wet it is, the more your opponent's likely to just have hit it, the more dynamic it is, the more likely the turn card is going to change the best hand possible. And when you understand those two concepts, then bet sizing becomes very easy because mm-hmm. if the board texture is really dry and it's very static, dry, meaning their range doesn't likely hit it static, meaning the best hand possible doesn't really change very often. And each of those cases, you can see bet really small a lot. Uh, when the board texture, the more wet and dynamic the board texture is, the larger you should be betting. And because the larger you should be betting, that means your betting frequency needs to tone back because you can't bet these really low equity hands. So if you just understand texture and you're constantly thinking, how wet is this board for this situation? How mm. dynamic is this board for this situation? You're just constantly thinking about those then bet size becomes super easy. But if you aren't thinking about those and you're not, you know, if that's not really concepts that you really think about regularly, then of course, betting, picking a size is going to be difficult because you don't have a framework to approach it. Most, so like the thing about poker is that to play it at a high level, the logic is actually very simple. The hard part of the game is learning what logic framework Mm. is what matters and how important it is Mm -hmm. and that stuff just takes you know having a guiding hand and also putting in lots and lots of effort and just getting good at thinking in these things like to become a good chess player it doesn't matter if you're like a genius or not the best chess players in the world just spend lots of times memorizing things and it's it's the same for poker you just need to memorize a lot of things yeah it's not sexy but it's true yeah exactly it's just it's hard work And, you know, it's working together and being willing to build community and work with others because, you know, look at all the best players in the world, all of them, literally every single one that I can think of had a a good circle of players around them that they used to improve and work with. Like Negranu came up with, um, he came up with, uh, 
as Fondiari, Phil Locke, um, someone else as well. Um, look at guys like like Jason Kuhn came up with Ike Haxton. Uh, Stevie Chidwick uh, came up with uh, Ike Kuhn. Um, if you look at like all the top like PLO players, all the top mm. tournament players, they all surround themselves with like-minded, high-stakes players that they study and work hard with. And if you're doing that, it makes the learning process much more interesting, but also much more easy as well. And, you know, the thing with like with rec poker and with LPP is that we give you guys easy access to players of similar mindsets and passion and ability. And that makes working together so much easier yeah. and less daunting. And you just need to put yourself out there and be willing to work hard. Do you do that? And like your goal is become a good poker player and to make good money in the game. I mean, the live poker events that I've played recently are the best I've ever seen, some of the biggest fields I've ever seen. And I think this year and next year will be two of the best years ever for live poker. Like, I am very, very excited for it, um, especially since I'm getting my second vaccine shot in a week from today. So I'm going to be hammering live poker, which will be absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and and uh, PSA, anyone who's living in Minnesota, apparently they're opening it up to uh, 16 and older as of the On 30th. March 30th, so. yeah. Yeah. So I know we've got a lot of Minnesota uh, fans out there tonight. I hope you go and uh, take care of yourself. Definitely. Definitely want to be protected and you want to do everything you can to be safe. And once you do that stuff, then, hey, the world is your oyster and the live poker games are great. There's lots of series running in Vegas and they'll be running all year. Yep. So this Jack 10 is kind of a weird spot. Um, I would probably be calling it pretty often. Chris using a six to go that big is um, I actually really like it. It's a, it's not really a spot that I would go that big with just a six, just because I'd be too worried about flushes. But if you think your opponent is going to be bluff catching you a lot, then it's going to be a really good candidate to use. Cause then now when you go that big, you don't just have these like really, really strong hands. Now you have some, <laughs> these decently strong hands as well, which makes bluff catching you versus you a lot more scary, which is really important. Yes. Yeah. Rephrase your question and ask it again. And while he's doing that, I'll just say that's one of the things we talk about um, when we talk about how aggression is so important, right? Just giving people an opportunity to fold. Uh, right. You know, people are going to overfold in a lot of spots like that. So. Um, and then when you do have really strong hands, now your all of your strong hands are getting happily paid off. Mm hmm. And it's just it's a good thing about aggression. That's just it's hard to play against. Uh, like my my uh, username is Bluff Starini and people make fun of me because I like to get my chips in the middle. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is, I mean, it, the, the only way to play well against aggressive players with big sizings is to continue with weaker ranges than you want right. to in hands. And that's like, that's just not that's an scary. easy thing. It's, it's scary. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's kind of like aggression. You're, you're not going to do everything right. So you're going to have some leaks in your game. So the question is like, what leaks are your opponents going to have a hard time exploiting? Right. Um, you know, if you're someone who overfolds, it's easy to exploit that because you just, you, mm -hmm. you bluff more, you get more aggressive. If your opponents are too aggressive, the exploit is not so easy uh, to pull yeah, the trigger Yeah, it becomes on, so. a little bit more difficult in spots because mm -hmm. like generally the reply against aggression is more aggression, not calling them more. And most people just call you more and it's easy as an aggressive player to go, oh, this person's just calling me a lot once we get to the river. So I'm just never going to bluff them. Yep. And then you think I'm this hyper aggressive punting player. And every time I triple barrel, I just have it versus you. And you think I'm lucky and running good. And instead I'm just literally never bluffing you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I love it. Yeah. Uh, window guy. Yeah. Rephrase your question and ask it again. <laughs> so this yeah. 10, three on the button, uh, it's actually a really good card for uh, a really good hand for us to triple barrel a lot. There's going to be a lot of good, really good turn cards for us. So on turns like, nines tens jacks queens i'm actually going to barrel down a lot here so this turn queen of hearts this is a wonderful candidate for us to double barrel so i'd probably be double barreling around three quarters pot as mm. taylor is doing here and then on a river three is actually a great card for us because we block two pair we block ace three we block king three we block seven three and you know we also block hands like jack ten uh but we unblock like a king nine we unblock those types of hands. So on this river three, even though we quote unquote river showdown, we actually lose to almost every single hand he has that's a pair. So mm. because of that on the river, I'm actually going to triple barrel and I'm going to go really big. Like I would have gone like 1.3 X pot. Mm. Even that ace three isn't like a thrilled call. 
it's yeah it's gonna call but it's it's gonna go yikes call <laughs> and if we can get top and bottom two pair to be unhappy with calling then we're doing a really yes. good job with bluffing yeah i like that and are there spots you've, you've talked about overbetting a lot and i think it's uh it's an underdeveloped part of our game uh, as recreational players um can you just talk a little bit about like what makes you select those those spots is it about it's, the capped range of your opponent or it's your... a mixture of who's going to have the best hand here more often which the player in position and the aggressor is going to have the best hand more often and then on top of that it's do we block their best hand possibles and then do we unblock some of their weaker hands and when mm. anytime we can do both like we did there we block their absolute strongest hand possible and we block a lot of just reasonably strong hands and then we unblock all their like middling hands that's going to be just such a good thing for us uh so window guy said if you only have five thousand to start should you be aggressive with only half your chips no um you have to just view your stack as this is how many big blinds deep I am. This is the situation that I'm in. And this is how I'm playing this spot. Yep. I love that. doesn't matter yes. what you had last hand. It just yep. matters what it's you just, started the hand this with. This is the new hand. This is my new situation. This is how I'm going to keep playing. And then what, like when your opponent applies tons of pressure on you, then you have to go, okay, my opponent's applying a lot of pressure on me. With my remaining stack, what can I do against this pressure? Should mm. I be folding? Because I'm risking too much of my chips on a, ooh, that's a, that's a really spicy rundown spot. <laughs> so Chris has a, a really good turn bluff catch. And Taylor barreling the turn is actually a really good thing because Taylor was turning in his hand into a bluff. And Taylor just got super lucky to drill like yep. one of the best cards in the deck that Chris also just always auto calls on. Yes. So like let's say the river was a king as well. Chris just gets cooler. And there's nothing Chris can do there outside of just call. Um, Chris there had one of the best hands to call with. He blocked four or five. He blocked ace X. So just blocking the really strong hands and having a pretty strong hand himself, he just has a very easy call. Yeah. Actually, as Taylor there, I would have gone way bigger on the river. I probably would have gone like 1.3x pot at like at a minimum. Yeah, because it's a very unlikely for him to have a two there. And, and he's going to be like, he, he was essentially bluffing on the turn seabed anyways. So Right, exactly. And it's a card that he's going to bluff on a lot. And if he's going to get to the river with some really strong, scary hands, mm. then all those hands are going to want to go really, really, really big. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he's all of his bluffs want to go really big as well. Because Chris should get to the river with that ace four and go yikes. <sighs> and if he's not yikesing, then you made a mistake at some point. Right. So this yep. five seven works very well as a check raise or check call. Having this gutter ball equity, it's it's more than enough to continue with upside of check raising though is that you can get this hand like queen eight to fold but you don't necessarily need to check raise to get fold so like now taylor can just lead this river and go somewhat small and target these king highs and queen highs and he can lead small with his three x his ace x his 10 x so this like four ten is actually pretty big because now he's kind of saying i have an ace or i have a deuce which if he goes smaller he can say i have an ace or a deuce or a three or a ten which is a lot more hands that the queen eight loses to. So I might've occasionally found a call there with that queen eight. Mm. Just because the sizing was suspicious to you. Yep, exactly. So this five, six, having a five, four, I would definitely be check raising, but even this five, six, I'm still going to lean towards check raising. And the reason why we check raises is, is look at all the cards we hate. For this mm. nine, 10, this nine, 10 turns equity on us on eights, nines, tens, jacks, kings, and they just get to barrel a lot. Like this 10-9 should have actually barreled this turn king of hearts. So we can call more of these types of hands if our opponent's under barreling. But I would hope that Taylor would get to this river and decide to bet. Um, it's a pretty important spot for him to do so. He can target those queen X and five X type hands. Um, but I would have barreled a lot here. Mm. I definitely would have barreled with this hand. I would have gone about half pot, repping king X, repping you know these big draws, repping ace X. And I'd be betting the turn happily with all my ace highs or with all my, you know, top pairs. Right. So this 510 should just be opening. 510 is more than strong enough hand to play. If you don't really want to open it, you can limp more hands and that's perfectly fine as well. But I'd rather just keep opening. 4-3, I would have defended as well. <laughs> there are no bad hands. <laughs> no, there are very few bad hands heads up. <laughs> One of the nice things about heads up and shorthanded is that there's like no place to hide. Yeah. So if your game has any leaks at all in it, you're going to find them out pretty quickly. If you have someone like me that's watching and 
you know, mm -hmm. can tell what mistakes they're making. It's also like one of the upsides of a game like chess is that chess, all the information is right there and it's all very obvious and there's no way for you to hide from your mistakes. At least in poker, you can hide from your mistakes by running really well. Um, and running really well is fun and you can, you know, make money in those spots. But, you know, when, when you're playing, especially, you know, everyone here that's playing more recreationally and for fun, well, obviously winning is a little more fun. You know, really your goal should just be focusing on making the best decisions you can, because for the most part, unless you're playing good volume, good results is more based off of luck than anything because volume is what is really dictates the difference between, you know, a skilled player and a weak player, you know, over the long term, the skilled player is going to make a lot more money grinding over the short term, you know, anything can happen, which is why poker is so big. You know, mm -hmm. if the variance didn't exist, you know, the amount of money in poker would be closer to the amount of money in chess. So right. this queen eight, uh, sorry, this queen six works great as a check call on this turn seven though, I would actually be leading it. It's a really good card for our range. Uh, we block some two pairs. We block some pretty strong hands. And I'm going to turn this hand into a river on a lot of, uh, into a bluff on a lot of rivers. So on this river nine, I'm actually going to bluff this queen six very happily. I'm um, going to probably do so for around two thirds pot. So I can rep every five, every 10 mm. and all these two pairs. And then when you go two thirds on the river, when aces is really unhappy, then you know you're doing a pretty good job. Also, if you think about it, it that that six loses to seven and eights and nines and jacks and loses to these over pairs and stuff as well so it's not actually have a lot of showdown but you block some pretty strong hands which is what's really important mm. and as we're getting through the match a little bit here we see that chris is getting down to just a little over three thousand chips so still plenty of room to play lots but, of playability oh yeah and, but I, I'm sure that's on his mind that he's just, right. you know, got fewer chips than his opponent at this point. Right. So something that's really difficult is what most people are doing. They're going, oh, I had 5,000 chips. Instead, you should just be going, okay, I have 3,000 chips now. This is my stack depth. These mm -hmm. are the decisions I should be making. And when you're constantly thinking in those terms, you don't really have that much time uh, or you, you just don't have brain space to even be worrying about what stack you had doesn't matter what stack you had before all that matters is what you can do mm -hmm. right now this moment and when you're thinking like that uh, which is much easier to do while you're in game playing you can really stay on top of things so like you know when when i'm like uh let's say i'm on a break i'm going to be a lot more you know worried about what's going on a lot more stressed out but when i'm sitting down at the table i'm just so focused on what i need to be doing that it's a lot harder for me to be like tilted and worried and stressed and that type of stuff because I'm just focused on making the best decisions I can and picking up information. So I, I know like how well I'm doing in terms of mindset when I'm just thinking about that stuff mm. and I'm not worried at all about the stack that I used to have or a stack that I should have in a spot, but someone sucked out on me or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is a form of tilt. Um, giving up part of your brain space to those irrelevant factors because Definitely. there's so much that you have to be paying attention to to be at your best and and your your attention is a finite resource so Definitely. Um, focusing it is is important not wasting it yeah that's one of the toughest things for like anytime I'm playing these big series and I'm putting in lots of long days especially mm. live is how much I'm distracted by my phone or doing these other things. At least now when I'm distracted, I can blame it that I'm working, which, you know, <laughs> isn't, you know, the best excuse, but that's why like, if I'm in like a day two or stuff like that, now I generally try to airplane mode my phone yes. and just ignore work stuff and just focus on the grind. Yeah. So this yep. a six works very well, actually as a flop C bet because it's very vulnerable hand. So I've noticed the same mistake from both of them is both of them are checking back these really vulnerable hands that, are, that actually have good equity. So like you, you definitely want to be betting those types of spots even, and like the middling hands have been checking back a little too often because they're like, I think most people do it because they're worried about getting check raise, but mm -hmm. those middling pairs are strong enough to face a check raise and call happily. Mm. Like you're not even annoyed by it. And since neither of them have really been check raising too often, you can actually just bet those comfortably. And then when they do check raise, since neither have been check raising very often, you can just fold them very comfortably. Yeah. yeah. I think that's having that intentionality about it too. You know, like having that right. plan for the entire hand, mm -hmm. um, knowing that your opponent's going to have certain tendencies. That's really smart. So it's obviously it's a lot easier as a commentator to see, you know, when you get both whole cards every time, it's easier to see their frequencies and that type of stuff. 
So what I'm constantly doing is anytime I'm playing, especially a match like this, I'm constantly just seeing what hands they got got to showdown. Mm. So, so if I'm playing live, I'm doing the same thing. Like uh, two hands will get to showdown and I'll have, you know, re thought about what they were doing on each street and then go, wait, why do they have this hand? What are they doing? Oh, they played pre-flop really passively. They played turn really passively and they have this, you know, pretty tight hand. Oh, okay. Then I see them show down again. Oh, they did the exact same mistakes. Okay, this player is a weak passive player right. who is under bluffing. And then it, it works the same way for heads up too. Except heads up, you get to see a lot more. So it doesn't take that many hands in a, versus a heads up opponent or mm. that long to see what their mistakes are since you show down so frequently. It's mm -hmm. also why in like mixed games, it's a lot easier to see who the weak players are because you get to see so much of every single hand so frequently and it, it can be pretty easy to see what types of mistakes people are making. And that's why like the good mixed game players are so ridiculously good because they just get so much extra info and mm -hmm. know what mistakes you're making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting, you were talking before about how there's nowhere to hide when you get heads up or shorthanded. And I mean, that's true because we're used to full ring where we get to right. fold a bunch of positions for free. And now mm -hmm. the blinds coming around more often, you're, you're getting post flop with hands that you wouldn't be comfortable getting post flop right. with. So you're in that weird dynamic a lot more. And I think it's also hard to practice mm -hmm. heads up and shorthanded play in a meaningful way. Um, right. Usually, you know, when you're playing shorthanded, it's it's at the end of a poker tournament, and right. you know you don't want that to be where you're learning how to play shorthanded. Definitely Do you have any, not. It, right, so we we've talked a bit about like sit and goes, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, like getting in our home game, which is play money, and so you can get some practice there. So just play, just try to play shorthanded in these types of games as much as possible. Really, one of the main ways, honestly, a good way to practice would be doing some sit and goes, but also just doing some heads up, uh, doing mm. some heads up sit and goes. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, there's actually a really, really good tool called Lucid GTL, like Lucid Dreaming, L-U-C-I-D. Mm -hmm. um, he has uh, heads up and three-handed. It's a full GTO tool. It's super sick. It's very well built. It's really cool. And it's, I want to say it's only 50 or 60 a month, mm -hmm. uh, but it has really, really, really good stuff in it. Um, and, and studying heads up and three-handed through that is I would very strongly recommend doing. The only issue, of course, is with it, you're studying peer GTO. So, you know, you have to keep that in mind when you start playing like against humans is that they're just not going to be as aggressive in a lot of different spots. And mm -hmm. a lot of things it tells you to do, it's telling you to do it because oh, your opponent's range gets here and has these hands. And when your opponent just never has those hands, and it's, you know, pretty, pretty difficult thing. Yeah. And you can really be shooting yourself in the foot, right? If your assumptions are wrong, it's a garbage in garbage mm -hmm. out kind of situation. Right. Exactly. So this 10-9 river bet's pretty thin. Um, I do think it was for value. Um, I guess I don't mind it. I would have rather had like King 10 or Jack 10 just so we beat more 10x. Um, but I do think it's fine. When you get check raised here, since neither of them really have been check raising very often, especially on previous streets, like the flop is the easiest street to check raise. So if your opponent really isn't check raising the flop very often, then the likelihood that they're going to be check raising turns or rivers pretty well is just not likely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people's check raising frequencies don't increase as the hand <laughs> right. progresses. Yeah. Um, something that I would actually say one of the best ways to just get practice shorthanded in tournaments is just play small fields. Um, because the thing is, is that final tables and shorthanded in those play vastly different than just singos. Mm -hmm. so like singos are like a fine way to study and practice, but the issue is that their payout structures aren't similar enough to tournaments um and people play them wildly differently because they're not worried about busting if you start in a right. sit and go taking fourth doesn't really matter but when even when you're on a final table of 100 entries you know you really don't like taking seventh place so people play <laughs> a lot more realistically so i would just focus on small fields as much as possible which if you play part-time and you're playing for fun you should be focusing on small fields anyways just to give yourself the best practice and the smaller the fields you play, the lower the variance you're going to have. So the more your skill is going to matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yep. this ace five off is a wonderful three bet jam. This is an auto jam. Um, now they're only 20 big blinds deep effective. So Taylor has, you know, 80 bigs essentially. But since Chris only has 20, we're actually playing 20 big blind deep poker. Mm. So I would only be minning or just over minning or limping. So at this depth, I would be limping long. Like this seven, six works pretty well as a raise or as a limp. It works very well both ways so either option that you take with it perfectly fine 
Uh, so there's five, four on this flop is a great check raise candidate. So the way this hand should play out is Chris should see bet, Taylor should check raise, Chris should jam, and Chris should, and then Taylor should fold. If they were a little bit shallow or effective, Taylor could actually just check jam this. So this turn nine is a great card for Taylor to lead. It's one of the worst cards for Chris's range. Um, you know, fours, eights, and nines are all really bad for him, as well as fives and sixes. So because of that, I would have led the turn and then probably have given up on the river. Mm. And do you do a lot? Do you do a lot of leads um, on turns and rivers as part of your strategy? Because yeah, leading turn is really, really important. Like mm. as I said before, like I don't really lead flop super often, but leading turn, whether heads up, multi way, whatever, there's so many different spots that are just really, really good for us. Mm. And again, the main way I'm doing it, you don't even need to think about the range. You just need to go: Is this card good for me? Yes or no? And when yes. the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> <laughs> then you should just be leading a lot. I love that. To lead big, you know, because like in that spot, the reason why we lead that turn nine is so that five four can get protection from the ace and king and queen highs. Mm. Like you're not even necessarily doing it on the turn to bluff. You're doing it more for value slash equity denial. Mm. And then on the river, you can decide whether or not to bluff and go really big or go a medium size or whatever. Mm. Yeah, the different streets, they really have their own uh quirks don't they and there's different yep. you, you different tools you want to use to achieve different purposes on different streets and i think so, we, don't, we don't really appreciate how even the same size bet on a different street can have a very different right, result definitely um and especially so flops and turns play pretty they work the same oh geez this is a brutal cooler uh, mm. i think we're about to see this switch back to uh very even stacks <laughs> this card is one of the best cards in the deck for taylor yeah. It's not a great card for Chris. So really we should see a bet, a call, and then on the river, depending on the exact river, there's going to be a lot of spots that Taylor is going to have to just bet really large. Okay. So now Taylor actually has an opportunity to find a fold, not necessarily on this turn on the turn. He's definitely going to have to call, but when Chris jams a river, like when he check raises this turn card, this is Taylor's turn card. Why is Chris check raising mm. my turn? Mm -hmm. You know, when, so when you're Taylor, you have to go, what is this? Why is he check raising my card? And when he is, and he's not a very aggressive, he hasn't been playing very aggressively. It, it should be alarm bells going off like none other. Mm -hmm. So either he has a hand like three, five, that's running some really good bluff that turned equity, or he just has what he has, which is he turned, he had two pair and he, you know, checked like he was opposed to. And then you bet a car that was really good for you and he's check raising and now he's going for value. Mm -hmm. So I actually think as Taylor, based off of how these matches have been playing, even if I haven't seen a single hand at showdown, like I have now, I'd probably be folding here versus almost everyone. The mm -hmm. only people I call here versus are people that have shown to be properly aggressive on previous streets. And since neither of them have really been showing that aggression, this should be a difficult, but definitely a fold. We also have a six in our hand, which is not good for us. Um, a five would be far worse. Uh, the five of clubs would be the worst card for us to have, but having a six isn't good. And the fact that Chris hasn't been that aggressive as well should make this a very viable fold. I still think a difficult fold. So if he does call, it wouldn't surprise me, but I think he is a capable player and can make a fold here. Mm. Ah, damn. <laughs> I tricky, wanted to see spot. the fold. Yep. And now yeah. uh, Chris has the chip lead here. Exactly. So I actually think as Chris that it's way better to check. Ooh, okay. Yeah, this is, this oh boy. is also just a, a dealt cooler. Yeah. So eights on 40 big blinds heads up is a very strong hand. And Chris has two options here. He can jam this or three bet and call a jam. Both are very reasonable. I think Taylor can just jam this since getting stuff like ace eight to fold is perfectly fine or like queen 10 to fold. And you can also just get called by worse hands or, uh, or even oh. Yeesh. Yeah, so this flop's really unfortunate for Chris because let's say it was like queen, you know, queen seven four. He's going to have a lot more opportunities to get away. Mm -hmm. Since nine five four, it's a lot more difficult for him to get away. Yeah. So if the turn's like something pretty low or a small board pair, if it's like a deuce, a three, a four, a six, a seven, an eight, even a, a 10, you know, those cards are all really bad for him because he can just go broke. Mm hmm. Uh, see posted the link in chat click on it if you guys are really enjoying the commentary 
Yeah, yeah it, deuce of hearts is like pretty brutal for Chris because the eights are very likely the best hand here, especially when you block a hand like nine eight. Um, and Taylor can have plenty of hands that are forced to call a jam mm. that are worse than pocket eights here. And Taylor can also just have some like ace highs and stuff, like or or even hands like ace four, or ace five, or ace deuce. <laughs> They're getting into the speech play here because Chris yeah. likes to add uh, fives to his bets just to <laughs> get under his skin. <laughs> so Taylor definitely needs a bet here and probably go somewhat small, target those like ace highs, stuff like that. Um, he de he definitely does not want to check back. Um, mm -hmm. He can definitely get called by pl like plenty of worse hands that have some showdown um, and also get called by all those ace highs. Yeah, it's tough when you've got top, top set because you're really kind of crushing the board and your opponent right. doesn't have as many of those value hands, like top pair hands that they want to be betting. But Yeah, so Taylor should jam this river, um, even though it's a little scary with the flush getting there. But since Chris would barrel almost all hands that have flushes, uh, Taylor just needs to jam to, to hope to get called by like a, a 10x type hand, an ace-10, mm -hmm. or like a true hero by like ace-4 or ace-5 or stuff like that. Hmm. But if uh, Taylor had bet turn, Chris would have called, and then Taylor can jam the river. And now these eights are a lot more viable of a stack off. By checking back, he allows a lot of these types of hands to, to just not get equity. But on top of that, when Chris three bets preflop, that gives him a lot more ace X, which is really mm. important to make sure that you get those calls. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing we're just not thinking about enough, I think, if you pull the, uh, pull the chat. Uh, yeah, hey, chat, let's put put some comments in. Um, who needs to study at LPP a little more so they can start thinking about all this stuff in real time at the table like Ryan LaPlante? Uh, there is a link down there. We'd love for you to go click, click on that. It. Join them, um, get a deal, five bucks off every month. And um, I, I mean, we talked before about uh, how Poker Tracker might be the best money you spend on software. I think LPP is just, uh, just at the tip of the spear when it comes to uh, bringing players like us up through the ranks of uh, poker players and so i think everyone would be well served by checking that out yeah. working and i feel as though that there's this like thought process a lot of people have that you need to be like a genius or anything like that to play poker at a high level or even to play poker profitably i mean the games are at least for live the games are incredibly good and the games online in the us are very good as well uh for the the legal facing sites mm. so you know if your goal is to have some fun and to you know be able to compete you can definitely do that um, and you know, the world series of poker will be back this year and it will be live this year. And you definitely want to be working on your game. If you want to give yourself a good opportunity for a deep run there. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of people that are not studying during this pandemic right. who are just interested in getting back to play poker. And, you know, you don't want to be one of those people, be one of those people who's been uh, working in the lab this whole time, getting better. And you can take them apart when so you get back six to six is a really good check call hand. Don't really have a need to do anything else with it. And the King Jack <clears throat> works pretty well as a check back or a barrel. I'm generally going to barrel this to set up a triple barrel because I want to target those six X type hands. I want to target the queen X as well. And on top of that, having the Jack of hearts in my hand means there's a lot more rivers that I'm just super happily tripling on. Mm. So I would have barreled the turn with intention of triple barreling. Not every river, but a lot of rivers. I would have gone like, 450, 500 on the turn, and then jam the river for a pot size bet. Mm. So this ace deuce works pretty well as either a limp and then a jam versus a raise if they're raising the types of hands they're supposed to be, or it works really well as a limp to a call, or it works well as a open jam and versus good players as well, you can raise call it. So every option pre flop is pretty good. With the queen 10, I actually would have raised pre flop very happily. You know, queen 10's way ahead of the button limp range. Mm. Um, on flop, I would just be calling as well. Generally want your opponent to try to turn some equity. Taylor's going to have a pretty easy check back, and he's generally just going to end up folding river. Um, the turn eight's a pretty bad card for him. Also, when he uh, bets flop and gets called, there aren't that many hands that are worse that can really pay you off on this turn eight. Um, and like because there aren't that many king X's either, you generally are just going to want to check back and then just fold on, on rivers. Boy, that check raise looks so strong from Chris there, yeah. eh? When he's only got like 2,000 chips back or 2,100 yeah, chips back. Yeah, Chris, I would not check raise here. Because mm. if, if I'm Taylor and I see that check raise and I have a queen, I'm just going, you just have it, right? And then <laughs> right. I fold. 
<laughs> yeah, and against an, an aggressive player like Taylor, um, you're liable to get an opportunity to get some chips in on a later mm. street there too. But I think, yeah. and, you know, Chris probably feels like he's he wants to be representing a balanced range there right. too, though, because he wants to be bluffing there sometimes. So Right, but tricky. he hasn't been bluffing in previous spots. Mm. And, and Taylor would have seen a lot of the hands that he's showing down with. And so yes. Chris has a question here. Yeah, take it, Ryan. Are you leading that river? Um, yeah, I probably would have led some rivers for sure. Um, that's generally the way I would have played it, is I would have checked call flop, check, check, turn, and then I would have led a bunch of rivers. And then I would also have led those rivers with my king highs and jack highs and my 8x and stuff as well. With a 6-8 suit, I'm definitely just going to defend this. Uh, so the way this should go is... Chris here at this stacked up actually has a really good check back, but he, it also, this hand works very well as a C bet because when you C bet and get check raise, you actually have enough equity to call or jam over the check raise, depending on the player. Um, and now in this turn six, yeah, we just have a pretty easy fold. Mm. Um, this is definitely a cooler at this stacked up because this King nine suited works very well as a jam or a call. Both are very reasonable at this stacked up. So if he shoves it and gets called, that's, you know, it's just a cooler. If he calls it, that's him get, being kind of lucky since <laughs> Taylor here actually has an auto call. Um, as Taylor actually would have seen about this flop pretty happily. Um, yeah, you could get check raise some, but like the thing is when you get check raise, you can call or jam. It like both work very, very, very well. Um, and the way this hand probably should have played is Taylor should have seen bet, Chris should have check raise, Taylor calls versus that check raise. And then Chris turns this really good seven barrels and then Taylor folds and Chris could have won a slightly bigger mm. pot. Mm -hmm. And so on, on that subject a little, Ryan, um, when we talk about how these players are kind of like disguising their ranges, mm -hmm. it feels like one thing that um, recreational players often do is they sort of strengthen their checking range right. um, by sliding some value hands in there. Uh, and then the other way to do that, like the other flip side of that coin is to weaken your betting range by putting right. weaker hands in there. Is there a right or a wrong way to do so that? Or? The issue with strengthening your check range is that like in order to strengthen your check range, you're also removing options in terms of like check raises. You're removing options in terms of leads. Like you're, you're, you're polarizing your aggression more and you're also being aggressive a lot less. And that's, what's really important is mm. that sure. When you check your range is a little bit stronger, but like when you like, let's say you check call flop way too often and you're under check raising. And cause that's like the main way that you actually end up getting a stronger check range is that most people check and then fold too often and under check raise. So then on turn, when they get to the turn and then they check to us, they just have this way too strong of range, which is a bad thing. It's not a good right. thing. Like, yeah, you can, you know, you get to call turn more often, but if I know your range is way too strong on the turn, then I'm just going to bluff less. Yep. So yep. like, uh, as Taylor against that turn check raise, I actually just would have folded based mm. off how the match has been playing. Chris has had it in every single check raise and he hasn't been check raising very often. So you actually have a pretty easy turn fold, even though you have a mid pair and a straight draw. And mm. on the river, when Chris checks, he never has a 10. Um, and we actually have a pretty good candidate to just jam on him because like he's just going to have a queen jack or a king jack almost always and like pretty much nothing else. Mm. And here they're splitting Chris's favorite hand. What, what's yep. going to go wrong here? This is a... So as seven, five off, this actually works pretty well as a three bet candidate. Um, it works perfectly fine as a call as well. Like now that we're shallow or effective, you can start mixing in some of these weaker hands as, as three bets. Um, mm. Because if they if you do get called, you're essentially either flopping equity and going with it or check folding for the most part. There isn't yeah. really an in-between. Yeah, it's I interesting how the- very often, but I would occasionally use it for sure. Yeah, so you're like, you're choosing hands that have different qualities because you're going right. to try and use them differently post-flop. So that, that right, makes a lot exactly. of sense. Right, exactly. And I- and like the thing is, is when you're building a three bet range pre-flop, you're doing so with intention of giving yourself better poor coverage post-flop. Mm. Otherwise, if you're only check raising those like high Broadway type hands, then anytime the board comes low middling, your opponent goes, ha, you miss. And they just win a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I always feel like there's this tension between playability when I'm trying to build out uh, polarized ranges between mm -hmm. like playability 
and blockers and right. you know like equity when called because i feel like there's right. a tension between a lot of those factors and there is and that's how do you why if you pull up range runner pro it'll be like this hands a 20 percent three bet this hands a 40 percent three bet this hands a 70 percent three bet mm -hmm. and the important thing to do with that is to go okay what types of categories of hands are like low frequency three bets what types of categories of hands are mid frequency three bets what types of categories of hands are high frequency three bets and when you see those in terms of like what types of hands are good bluffs and not, then you can just mix in some. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, let's say you're grinding super high volume on some site, well, then you can use an RNG device. Or if you're playing live, you can just go, okay, these are the types of hands I can use. Is this opponent the type of opponent I want to use yes. this type of hand verse? Nice. Yeah, that, that's poker, the way I think about it. Yeah, yeah poker these days same as the old days is about who is your opponent and what mm. can you get away with? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, we understand the theory at a much higher level, but since there's still, there still is that human element that exists, whether you're playing low stakes, mid stakes, high stakes, super high rollers, like you name it, that still exists. And that's also what I'm constantly thinking about. Mm. Uh, Jason Kuhn had a wonderful post about thinking and playing uh, high level poker and it, it lists like 25 different things that he's thinking about in game. And some of those things, even in the high rollers, is still, who is my opponent? Yeah. So this these hands pre-floppers are monsters at the stack depth. This king 10 can very comfortably jam. They can three bet. They can call. They all work very well. This a7 suited works very well as a call versus three bet or as a jam. And if you think your opponent's been way too tight on their three bets, you can even find a fold. Uh, I would say that this was a pure GG, but since there is a flop flush possible, and since a lot of Taylor's range is going to be like suited hands or hands like some these weak ace X that don't really want to jam, as well as some strong king X as well, uh, Chris might be able to find a way to not go broke here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, versus jam, it's, it's kind of awkward. Um, like there aren't that many hands that Taylor's really should be jamming here. And the main ones that I would kind of like think that he might have are like queen jack with the diamond, queen 10 with the diamond, mm -hmm. jack 10 with the diamond, nine ten with the diamond, <laughs> and then some of these like weak ace x. So yeah, it is an ugly spot. Um, Taylor probably never jam a king here, which actually makes this king way more often of a call. I like the speech um, play I with the players at the table too. <laughs> I think so. I'd probably find a fold, but I wouldn't fault Chris at all for calling here um, just because Taylor can have single diamond hands pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good and very disciplined fold. I like mm -hmm. that fold a lot. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely, they know each other very well, these two players. They've played mm -hmm. together a lot. They know what each other's capable of. Um, so I think they're going to, they should be making good decisions about each yep. other's play. And we've seen that too, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah i think there have only been a couple of spots where each one probably made a mistake against the other so mm. this a6 works great as a jam or as a limp mm. um if we do raise you do have to raise call it so from a theory decision this jack 10 off if your opponent is shoving perfectly is a snap call mm. jack 10 runs very good equity versus the types of hands that they're supposed to be jamming um it just works a lot and is there, uh, so then that's Jack 10. Um, how far down the rankings do you go before that stops to be the case? Like 10, nine, nine, eight. Yeah, 10, nine, I'm probably folding versus most okay. people. Yeah, um, so it's going to be a call versus some, but I would fold it versus a lot. Uh, Jack 10 is just going to be a call versus a lot of people. It's only really a check fold if you, or it's only a fold if you think they're just way too tight on their shoves. And, and how much of that is because it's a Broadway capable hand and how much of it is just the power of not like the difference well, between having a, a nine and a 10. It's just a Broadway capable hand and flips a lot. Yeah. So, and yeah, like yeah. a lot of your opponent's jams are going to be hands like the offsuit ASX and stuff like that and deuces through, you know, all stuff that you're flipping versus mm -hmm. like, it's just, it's hard versus a loose jam range. It's hard for you to not have good equity. Yes. Like I'd be calling like Jack 10 off. I'd be calling like queen eight suited queen nine off like king six suited king eight off um every ace every pair um and technically you can go looser than that if they're shoving the types of stuff that they should be shoving mm -hmm. so this nine eight pre-flop actually works pretty well as a check or as a raise you can do both with it if we were a little bit shallower i'd actually jam it a lot um and actually as a nine eight i would lead this flop this is a great flop for our range our opponent's mm -hmm. not going to hit this very often and i definitely would have bet the turn 
uh, at pretty high frequency. Um, River, I'm probably going to bet this as well, but I would be okay with the check. Give our opponent an opportunity to try to bluff. Mm -hmm. And then with this king six, I'm probably just going to fold it. There aren't that many hands that, they, that they're going to be bluffing with. When it checks, 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 it's hard for us to have a flush. There's a lot more hands that they can have that are like two pairs. Plus, they can now have every straight as well. So when they loosen, when their value range loosens, then we can actually find some tighter folds in those spots. And also, we saw Chris earlier go really big with that bear six on that straight and flush board. Yeah. It shows that he's capable of going really thin for value in those spots, which yeah. just makes those hands more of a fold. Like you mm -hmm. want to call those spots when your opponent only has bluffs or air, not when they have a wide value range. Right. So this queen jack suited works very well as a call or a jam. Uh, the three bet's fine as well. It is a powerhouse. And if you three bet, you can get hands like the that five nine suited call. Um, I, I'm honestly, I'm perfectly okay with both options with it. So it's, Jack three should be at minimum limping, but it's a great raise hand because if you raise and get shoved off of it, it's perfectly fine. Mm. Same with this king three. It's a great hand to raise with. Um, and, and honestly, none of those hands I would ever fold the button with anyways. Mm. Like the option is to limp or to raise, not to fold. The only mm. hands we should ever really be folding are like deuce three off, deuce four off, deuce six off, deuce seven off, you know, eight, three off, eight, nine off, like you should, or eight or nine, three off. You should only mm. really fold like the bottom, like 5%, especially when there's an ante. Um, I might even be a little bit tighter than that. And without an ante, I'd only be folding like the bottom seven to like 12%. I really mm. wouldn't be going as, as deep as Jack three off on top of that. If our opponent is under jamming on us, which based off how both of them have been playing, we could probably make that assumption then they all just come in like i would fold literally nothing i would just be <laughs> raising a lot of buttons and be applying consistent pressure until my opponent showed that they were capable of really reapplying pressure on me mm -hmm. i make them show they're capable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like and then you can say, dial it back right that's yep, a exactly yes. yeah you don't yep. have to keep your foot on the gas yeah so this right. five nine off i'd be defending for sure and if I ever thought that they might be folding a hand that strong, I would just raise literally every button with everything. Mm -hmm. I would just never not raise a button. Because mm. like that hand's actually a pretty strong hand, especially the shallower effective you are. Like I'd be more apt to fold that five nine off at like 80 big blinds than I am at 20 big blinds. Mm -hmm. Even though it sounds a little bit weird because when you're at 80 big blinds, you're like, oh, I'm risking such a tiny portion of my stack. That's a cheap call. And at you know 20 bigs or 15 bigs, you're like, whoa, if I call here, I'm risking you know, 6% of my stack, which yeah, you are. But the thing is, is post flop, when you flop any equity, you get to go with it, which that's, what's really important. Yeah. It's fun too. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I'm in the equity realization business. So that's a... so this ACE 10 suited, we can jam it or call it both are perfectly reasonable. I would generally just jam though. Now this five, six versus a, a min raise. I'm just going to defend if they limp, I'm generally just going to check. Hmm. I'm generally going to use a slightly stronger hand if I'm going to raise. It says bluff strawny. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's right. Bluff Storini. Just can't oh, can't help sorry. it. Bluff That's Storini. okay. Can't help to get him in. <laughs> so this turn jack's a really good card for the jack eight. So I'm probably just going to barrel it, target the nine X, target some draws and stuff as well. I actually wouldn't go this large because mm. you're still pretty worried about them having a seven and yeah. having hands like eight, 10. And when you bet that large and they jam, that's a little bit extra of your little bit extra of your stack. Yeah. And when the stacks are short like this, that does make a big difference, right? Yeah, Those extra a chips. Pretty huge difference for yep. sure. And when we get down to this point, it's like it's fewer than 20 big blinds effective. Uh, do you have do you have like a non all in three bet sizing here or is it just shoving? Um, at 20 bigs, I'm definitely going to have some non all in three bets. Uh, technically, at 15 bigs, you can still have some as well. Um, but out of ease, I'm mostly just like rip or call. I don't yeah. really have um, in position is a little bit easier to have the non all in three bets out of position. It's it can be kind of awkward. Also, the stacked up, it just it really sucks when you three bet 
not all in they call a hand like you know seven nine suited that drills it on you just yeah that's just frustrating that sucks so it's it's also it's easier from a theory point of view to build a range that's calling or jamming Mm -hmm. it's much easier it's just Mm -hmm. much less complex and generally a good rule of thumb is to try to keep your game as simplified as possible but as complex as you are personally comfortable with Mm. That's a great rule. That's a great rule because a, a big key to the game is keeping it simple mm-hmm. and, you know, not, not making it an infinite number of branches right. in the decision tree, grouping things together right. and putting exactly. them in buckets. Um, so I think that's really exactly. smart. Exactly. Really smart. Um, and that's actually what chess players do um, mm. because in, instead of, oh, they opened this pawn to this piece, they did this, they did that. Instead it's, oh, they use the queen's gambit opening, which is taking your pawn and opening on the queen and going for two spots and yes. defending the center. They think in terms of this theory, this overall decision-making. They don't go, you know, they remember these types of things. They go, oh, first they did the queen's gambit and then they took the whatever conjecture and yada, yada. And it's it's just a series of hands that are played out pretty typically by, you know, high-level players. And it's much easier to think about and approach things in those types of spots. Mm. So that mm. Jack nine, I would have bet flop all day because when my opponent check raises me, you bet I'm stacking off there. So I think with that Jack nine, I actually would have bet flop barrel turn and then jam river and would have taken it down from that mm. King nine. And then on the river, when he leads, because he's been leading pretty thin for value in some of those types of spots, I actually would have used the Jack nine as a bluff raise instead. Mm. And I might've just like jammed on him and acted like I was trapping the entire time or that I just had an eight. Yeah. You never know. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He doesn't know. He doesn't get to know <laughs> bit of a cooler flop, but so this type of spot, the ACE should actually lose a pretty big pot because the Jack five is very incentivized to, to check raise. But since neither of them have really been check raising very often, now the Jack five has to check call. And when he's check calling, you know, it's kind of hard for, uh, for the ace deuce to really get that much, you know, value out of it. Um, it's hard for the Jack five to get that much value out of it too. So actually as his ace deuce, I wouldn't be barreling a King ever because the main hands that Chris calls with that aren't a deuce are a Jack or a King high. So the turn King is actually one of the worst cards in the deck for Taylor, if not the worst card in the mm-hmm. deck for him. Uh, that that type of turn being bad for him is really unintuitive. So it's not surprising that he saw the king was like, oh, that's a good card for me. But really, for Chris's flop calling range, because it has so much king X, it's actually a really bad card for you. And that's one thing I think um, I'd also like our members to be thinking more about is what are what is the effect that that action has on our opponent's range? Right. Like the, the continuing range, we, I think right. we, we don't pay enough attention to how that action contorts that range. And that's why constantly visualizing their range is really important. Because yeah. if on flop, you go, okay, they don't have an X because they would have jammed pre. So they called in the flop with a deuce, a jack, or what other type of hand? Then you go, oh, they probably have some king highs that they're calling. Might not call many queen highs. And versus the queen highs, you don't need to really bet because they're not going to suck out on you very often mm. on the river. And this ace do should be a pretty easy fold because anytime someone's like doing a line that's incongruent, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, then they just have value very often. Yep. I like that. General rules, right? I think. Yep. You want to have as many simple, easy rules to follow as possible. (laughs) And that's what I like try to do my best to teach is that. Yeah. And you do a great job with that. That's something everyone always says is that you, you'd make complicated things simple and you make things that are hard to understand. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it is what makes it's what. Listen, not all great poker players are great teachers. No, you know, like it takes it true. takes both. They're, they're different skills, and mm-hmm. so Definitely. that's one of the things. That's one of the things I think that makes you great about it is you make these ideas something that uh, less Our skilled players can relate to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. what I put a lot of work into. Best <laughs> at doing that. Good man. So, shows. pre is pretty typical by both uh, flop, both making very good decisions. This turn, uh, Taylor just can't really do anything but fold here um chris just has all these incredibly strong hands and while taylor technically does have a pair and a straight draw you know chris also can just have ace 10 ace jack ace queen queen jack king queen king jack and there aren't that many bluffs that chris is going to have and all of them have like 
queen x of diamonds or jack x of diamonds or like you know jack nine type stuff all right so this should just be folded nine deuce one of those rare <laughs> uh, this so five eight should be a complete for sure and then the king ten suited would have jammed seven three should be a complete with eight five checking yeah so some of these common uh, uh overfolding the these lousy hands at 11 well 10 and a half fakes Yep. There it is. And then nine seven just has to fold. And that's why it's important to shove the king set four because you get a hand that has a lot of equity versus you to just fold. Mm -hmm. Four three suited should be a complete. Uh, it's ace jack. I'm generally going to min now that we're at 12 bigs and the king seven suited should call or shove. Both are very reasonable. We do jam the ace jack. The king seven suited should call. Um, but if I saw some of the folds and stuff, I might actually find a fold here. But I think calling this would be very reasonable on the stacked up. <laughs> yeah, Chris feels the tension there. You can yeah. see. <laughs> he knows that this is a close decision, and it is a very close decision. Versus a lot yeah. of players, this is a pretty comfortable call. Versus a few players, it's a fold. Yeah. And it's just, it's different when you're on the world stage of Marek Madness Championship. You know, the pressure is really on. These guys are feeling it. You can tell. Yeah, so I like this call. <laughs> I think it's very reasonable. That's a oh, juicy. very action flop. Ooh, mm. pretty turn card and a, a a sick hold for the ace jack. It yep. would have been a lot more interesting if the turn was like a, a king of heart or something <laughs> to give yeah. a little action. Give a little more out. Sweat. Yeah. <laughs> so the queen six suited here can uh, mainly just limp. The nine eight suited actually has a really good hand to jam or check. They mm. it works perfectly fine both ways because like when you jam a hand like this. Even when your opponent has some of their traps, you run really good equity. And you can get hands like that king, that queen six suited to fold. So it works perfectly fine either way. Yeah. The queen five is a really good raise. And then this board texture is very good for the uh, pre flop, play, oh, the button, because a uh, small block, or sorry, the big blind should just be, you know, raising and jamming all their strong hands. So when you see this flop, you should go, oh, I'm at large range advantage and then bet mm. this queen five. Mm -hmm. Especially mm -hmm. as a board texture as well that your opponent just isn't going to check raise very often as well. So you have a pretty easy bet and takedown. So anytime uh, this short, it's not as obvious like what the best decisions are um, or like who has, ooh, well, we have a pretty auto jam and a pretty auto call yep. here. See if the king seven can hold. And no, there's that hold, spade. There's that spade he even. needed. He needed that spade earlier. <laughs> so uh, it's not very obvious pre-flop in these spots that when the button uh, completes and the big blind checks, button has that large range advantage because button can still have all their really strong hands. Mm. The big blind cannot. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a really good insight. That's really smart. That's so why you're 10, a pro seven, I'm probably just going to check it, but this also works pretty well as a raise. We can go three and a half X here. Uh, looks like Taylor is doing that. We can shake these types of hands. And if we do get called, we have some pretty good equity post flop. And yeah, this is a very close match. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's gone back and forth a few yeah, times now. And fourth, a ton. Chris has a slight chip lead now, but the stacks are getting very short. So we're going to see yep. some, some pre-flop uh, matches and surely surely there's a, a setup deck coming or something and i like that they're they're not getting they're not afraid to put that bottom chip in here when they mm -hmm. get to to the stack depth relative uh, to the well blinds. we've got another cooler a pure flip going to be for, oh, yeah. essentially for the match because if uh if fours win it's going to be 8k to 2k if this ace 10 wins that is gg mm. and the ace 10 has a pretty auto call it's a pretty big flop for ace 10 Maybe Still too many good. outs. Oh, oh too, too many, many outs. outs. <laughs> Way too many outs. Taylor's fist pumping <laughs> wherever he is. He's pretty excited about that, I think. I'm sure he's dancing like none other. Yep, that's On right. Another cooler. Oh, this might pretty do it. Pretty auto jam, pretty auto call. Oh, oh, oh he's well, saving okay, him, that'll... saving him. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh wait. Okay. okay. Oh, man. Good Lord. Bad. See, it is more exciting when you get those chips in the middle, isn't it, <laughs> folks? <laughs> King seven suited. There's been a lot of king seven suited battles here. Mm. Yeah, power hand. Changing, changing my favorite hand. I'm pretty sure that says. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so this turn six, oh, so as Taylor, I definitely would have bet the flop, but I'm now I'm definitely betting the turn. Turn six is obviously a bad card for Chris and that it gives him a pretty easy call. Um, the river four of diamonds. So as Taylor, I would actually be betting this for value. And then as Chris, I would be check jamming this as a bluff. Mm. I think this is one of the best bluff hands because mm. we block eight, five, we block eight, nine, and we block eight X of diamonds, which is really important to block all those hands. We also block all the two pairs as well. So, and like, while a hand works okay as a call, it works wonderfully as a jam. And we have another forced flip here and be an auto jam and an auto call for both. For the match, A7 and 9. Wow. Another sick is. hold by Taylor and wow. winning the Ma Rec Madness Championship. <laughs> Nailed it. So, congratulations to Taylor Moss. Uh, once again, the inaugural Rec Poker Champion. So I, we got to still, we, you know what, uh, Steve Fredland, if you're still in the chat, we should just record us saying Taylor Moss inaugural rec poker champion. It would save a lot of time every time we have to come and do this new announcement live every time we do something new and Taylor comes out to win it. Congratulations, Taylor. Uh, good game. Uh, Chris, that was a really phenomenal match. I'm really glad we did a best two out of three at the end there because we got to see some great poker. We got to uh, keep Ryan the plant occupied for as long yep. as physically possible. And uh, I know I just had a great time here. And I, I, I think Chris had a really good time too. Even though he lost, he, he's going to um, be feeling that one for a while, I'm sure, especially against his nemesis. Like, <laughs> did it have to work out this way? But um it was a lot of fun. It was a great match. And we'll, we'll check in on, uh, I think we'll do one more check on the brackets at the end, but I do want to thank um, Mark Prashan, Andrew Feist, John Somsky, um, Taylor Moss, uh, Chris Jones, <laughs> Steve Fredland. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm forgetting somebody, but we had the big eight in there uh, starting this off the elite eight and um, again, Taylor as the producer has done a really good job. He's really done most of this by himself. So um, when you see Taylor in the home game, uh, give him a, hey, thanks, um, as he's taking your chips, which is typically what happens in the home game. And of course, I'd really like to thank all our Twitch uh, viewers and people that have been here hanging out with us and typing in the chat. It's so much more fun uh, for us when we get this kind Definitely. of feedback from you guys and we can feel the excitement. And uh, it makes it more more exciting and, and more fun for us as well. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, I mean, Ryan LaPlante. Ryan freaking LaPlante, everybody. Uh, how amazing is that? So I'm going to wake up and not sure if this is a dream or not, but it's been a, a freaking spectacular night for me. Uh, yeah, Kim Binkley says he was one spade away from a perfect bracket. I know. Yeah, pretty brutal. <laughs> uh, now, does anyone have any, just before we close, if anyone has any more questions or um, anything they want to put into the chat before we yep. get out of here? Um, Feel free to fire away. Yeah, we don't get a chance to uh, sit down with a legend like this very often. So um, if you have any, any more questions, and, and of course, um, if you have questions specifically to do with Seabet uh, defense, um, you should join me on Saturday at uh, noon central. Um, all the premium rec poker members and l any Learn Pro, poker mem uh, Learn Pro yep. poker members welcome to join. Uh, we'll be talking about minimum defense frequencies, uh, check raise factors, um, C bet theory, a lot of this, a lot of uh, the stuff that we went over tonight as well. So that'll be really interesting. And uh, Steve has a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ryan, how long did you play heads up when you won your bracelet? It was a pretty long match. Uh, my opponent, uh, so it was a PLO bracelet, and my opponent actually was a high stakes PLO cash player, um, and he played incredibly well the entire way through. We started off pretty deep effective, and we played, I want to say like a three or four hour match. And the way in which I won was actually kind of sick because I won with the board pair counterfeit that my rail didn't know I could win on. <laughs> And when I, when I binked it, they didn't realize it. And I was just watching their reaction. So I wasn't even watching the board. I knew what all my outs were, but they didn't. So I'm watching the rail and I know the river gets dealt and they're silent. And I go, oh crap, I've got to go back to battling this guy. And instead the TD goes, oh, and Ryan wins. And everyone, you know, erupts. And I'm like, wait, what? I won? I thought I lost. <laughs> Yeah, so that was kind of silly. <laughs> oh, that's great. It, you, but you need, yeah, got a great story out of it too, right? Yeah. I think exactly. that's so much of the fun we have in poker, these stories we make along the way, uh, the friends that we make and sort of like these characters that we encounter in these weird spots that, uh, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't get that kind of um, experience in a lot of the other games 
um, and hobbies and competitions out there. So it's one of the things that makes poker great. Um, so let's take let's take a look at the uh, bracket uh, results. Yeah, here we go. We've got it pulled up here. So this is final. Um, so it looks like John Letsey and Ben Marr uh, are tied for the number of points at the top there, uh, both picking Taylor over Chris. And then there's three players, Chapo, East Coast Bitter, and Binkley, uh, who all have eight points. So I think there is a tiebreaker. I don't actually, this is embarrassing. I don't remember exactly. We'll, we'll probably just end up posting it. I know one of the tiebreakers was the uh, number of matches. And I think the other one was actually the number of hands. So mm -hmm. we'll have to go in and see um, how the actual tiebreaker bo broke out. But um, four out of those five uh, members are going to enjoy a free month at Learn Pro Poker. Compliments of this fine gentleman right over here. So uh, thanks again, Ryan. And John Letzi, Elizabeth, Troy, uh, Ben, and Eric. Uh, you can either just email me, jim at rec.poker. Um, or you can that all, all sorted out. So uh, if there aren't, if I guess we'll take one more quick look at the chat. And I think most of people are just saying that they had a great time, which I really appreciate. That's fantastic. And uh, yes, it was, it was a lot of hands. So take the over. <laughs> it was good advice from Steve Fredland. All right, well, uh, once again, I'd like to thank Taylor Moss for putting this all together um, and Rec Poker Nation for all the support that we get not just here on Thursday nights, but throughout the week, we do so many events, so many tournaments and learning sessions. Um, it's really great to get people out here all hanging out together. Definitely. And uh, next Thursday will be our normal uh, Thursday night Twitch stream with Taylor. So he's gonna play in the home game every Thursday night at nine and he gives away a couple prizes as well. You can uh, show up for that and have a good time and tell him how much fun you had. And uh, please go over to Learn Pro Poker and uh, just try a month. Try a month, you'll be amazed at the volume of high quality training material there. And, and also, mm. if you're not amazed, just send me a message on Discord and I'll give you a full refund. Yeah, come on. You can't, you can't argue with that. You can't argue with that. Go check it out, uh, risk-free. And um, I, you know, I've said this before, uh, Ryan's really generous with his time on Twitter too. You can see there if you go to at ProtentialMN, um, he does a lot of great, like, like really training oriented uh, tweets and that sort of thing too. A lot of these great polls, multiple choice things that help you develop as a player, see how other people are acting in those same spots because you can yep. see the results afterwards. So I really encourage people um, go to uh, at potential MN and scroll down and see some of these uh, poll uh, tweets that he does. Cause it's really, it's, it's a really great interactive way to learn. And of course it's mm -hmm. free. Um, and Ryan's just so generous with his time as well. If you go to the Discord server, he's in there all the time uh, talking about hand histories. He puts his own training uh, videos, his own coaching sessions up. So I know I, I talk about it a lot, but I just I'm, I love being involved with LPP. Ryan's such a class act, and I would just recommend anyone go over there and check it out. Um, so please do. And uh -huh. yeah, go ahead. Oh, I hope everyone enjoyed the commentary, enjoyed the match. I think Chris and Taylor both played great. It was a nice long battle, which was great to see. I'm glad that it went down to the wire too. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the commentary and everything as well. Um, I certainly really enjoyed doing it. So it's always good to get back in the booth when I'm able to. And as Jim was saying, you know, Rec Poker and LPP will be doing a lot of this type of content and more going down in the future. So keep stopping by Twitch dot tv slash poker check out recpoker.com and click on uh, the rec poker uh, learn pro poker link if you want to join because that will help them out in the best way possible and if you use user code you will also get five dollars off per month um, so make sure you do that as well thank you very much for having me on everybody i really really do appreciate it and i had a lot of fun cheers thanks again it was a real treat okay good night everyone and i uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in rec poker nation sometime soon Suck it, Chris. Signed, the inaugural champion. <laughs>